Hello everyone and welcome back to Apollo's Odyssey. Today I have a very special guest with us and I'm gonna bring him on in a minute here. But uh, today's show is gonna be about uh, resolving childhood traumas and we're also gonna get into the entertainment industry, Hollywood, uh, child human trafficking, but we're gonna to try to keep it light though, even though we're getting into these dark topics, we wanna to keep it light. Um, but we're going to kind of relate this all over to the transhumanist agenda. So uh, before I get started here, I just want to say I still have a few Shaman Spears left on shamanspears.com. So make sure you go check those out. The studio is almost finished and ready to go. So if you want to check out, uh, if you want to see that happening soon, you want to see some awesome projects coming out of my new studio, make sure you go on shamanspheres.com and check out my art. All the art helps fund the studio. So, all right, let's bring the guests on here. Hey, Paula. How are you doing? Hey, John. It's, it's good to, to see me. you. Uh, I haven't seen you in person since DC and, you know, that yeah. whole, uh, I guess it was a little bit festive of a fiasco. Event. <laughs> yeah, definitely a festive event. That's for sure. Uh, so yeah. if you can, would you uh, give everyone a little introduction of who you are, what you're about? <laughs> sure, absolutely. So, um, yeah, my name is John Paul Rice. Um, uh, what people would know me as in terms of my role in the world is uh, for 20 years, I've worked in Hollywood. I uh, started my career in Remember the Titans as a Titan football player. And uh, that sparked me to move out to Los Angeles a year later. I got on uh, We Were Soldiers with Mel Gibson. And these were, you know, these weren't like starring roles. These were just the first roles that I had in film. And uh, I also did some independence, little micro budget independence in Atlanta. But um, I found my way through Hollywood working at an independent company uh, where I started answering phones and reading scripts. And I learned marketing, sales, distribution, producing, uh, production, both the creative and the marketing. And then there was the international sales and distribution. And I spent four, four to four and a half years there uh, while trying to start producing my own movies. And the thing was that I went from acting into producing and it wasn't that hard because it was just an, an, an uh, it felt so good to be able to find talented people, you know, other talented actors and, and like see all that come together. That was kind of like the cool part about making a movie. That's what I experienced on Titans. I used to think I wanted to be an actor, but really what I saw was like the whole production of it fascinated me. You know, each department, each personnel, all the different functions of the organization, the planning that goes into it. I mean, there's a lot of detail that goes into making a movie that we we just assume it's a camera and lights and actors. Like, hell no, man. Uh, all of this is like work. It has to be planned out, organized in such a way um, to an efficient and productive level. Um, but it led me, after I had a couple of uh, what I would call failures in terms of I tried to launch my first film at 25 years old as a producer with a three to $4 million budget. And the funny yeah. thing was, is that I got so close within about three years when it all fell apart over a weekend because of things that were out of my control. I just said, you know, my business partner and I, he was like, we got to make a movie this year. And I ended up making my first film, uh, one hour fantasy girl, which is based on a true story. Uh, really a heartfelt film about a girl, not as a prostitute, but as a dominatrix giving any fantasy to a guy 
for $150 an hour, as long as there's no sex, no nudity, and is 100% legal. And you just go. That's yeah. very interesting. I haven't seen that one yet. I want to check that out. Yeah. I actually, um, <clears throat> I've actually been kind of involved with that scene just because I had some roommates in the past in LA that like mm -hmm. ran the fetish scene in LA. I just I had a house with them and they were like a couple and they're actually psychologists, but they like kind of ran these like huge events that were like people would just kind of dress up and come and mm -hmm. hang out really, but um in, in like theaters like globe theater and everything in downtown la but uh I, it was really interesting to me because i was like really weird out about it but they actually kind of like told me like this psychological side of it all mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so it was interesting seeing it all from their control perspective. control and and it's energy you know it's energy uh at the fundamental level um submission domination um but that kind of I guess I'm giving you guys that background because that movie was made in total budget for what I was supposed to get on my salary <laughs> on the other film that didn't happen. And so I was disappointed, not in that I wasn't making a movie. I was happy to make a movie, but I was disappointed that I didn't make the big movie and move into the bigger club, you know, uh, which today I'm very grateful that I did not. So in looking back at it, it was a blessing in disguise that it moved me away from going further into Hollywood. And so I made, I made six independent films, micro-budget indies, One Hour Fantasy Girl, Memories of a Lost Love, Magic Stone, um, Mark's Secret to Eternal Life, uh, A Nice Quiet Life, and then the last one, A Child's Voice, which came out in 2018. Uh, each one of these films were subjects that just grabbed me or the writer. It was a concept. It didn't matter who came up with it. Um, we both committed ourselves. We made a movie every year and a half, whereas a lot of my friends, uh, they'd make one or two, and then that was it. We also kept all of our rights to our movies, so we didn't sell our movies or give them away to distribution companies um, long before there were really any other options like there are today. And I think that benefited us in the long run because we found ways that once the once the technology had caught up to the way films were being, you know, handled and distributed versus in the theater 10, 20 years ago uh, as a mainstream thing. Uh, nowadays, we're, we're now our company has six of our movies in uh, on 20 different platforms in 98 countries worldwide. And. Our movie, One Hour Fantasy Girl, I mean, I'm just going back to this. This was made in 2008, 2009. Um, that is one of our number one selling films all around the world in different countries. And I know that the title has a little bit of intrigue to us, a little bit more than an intrigue. But once people discover it, what they find, it's a very heartfelt story about a girl who is stuck and she can't get out of the situation she's in. She wants to make enough money so that she can invest in real estate. Sort of like a, it's a tragic situation because you, you really want to root for her and you know, that she has it because she's, it's not like a, like a stupid fantasy for her. This is like a reality for her. And what you learn in the story as it progresses with her business partner, which you'd call him pimp, but not really. They're both into she he's into music, she's into real estate, and they're kind of both kids that are stuck in this horrific, ugly world of of betrayal and violence and danger and uh, loneliness. So it painted a, a different picture than the sexy, glamorized kink fetish thing. And it really stripped it down to the humanity of this poor. And when I say poor, not because she's a woman, but this poor soul that is having to endure all of these internal, you can really read it in her, the way we cast this girl and it was, she was directed, Kellyanne Tercy, she's a fantastic actress in this film. But it was, it was this, this gentleness and this sweetness that came through and this tenderness through all of this brutality and it was all to make it and survive today and make it to another day. That's what it all came down to. And the, the turn in kindness was that there was like a breadcrumb given to her at the right moment that, that 
changed her where she could have gone, where she would have been, what she would have done. So, um, I, I, you know, I, I look at all these films that we did and each one of them explored different, both arenas and topics, but also realities for people. And, and these are stories that were not being told. I mean, we did a movie called Memories of a Lost Love that I personally think is, I mean, it's one of the most tragic and beautiful films that I've ever done. Um, and I, I think in, in years to come, when we kind of start becoming conscious of what child abuse does to our children and homes, which we'll talk about tonight, um, you know, I did a movie about a man who witnessed his mother killing her boyfriend in front of him and leaves home to go run away and restart his life. And he lands up in this small town, meets this girl, wants to go to school, get a job. She doesn't know what's going on. And he doesn't really even know what's going on. And it's, it's poet poetic because it's all a, the whole project progression of that film. It's like a slow burn that accelerates like comes to a head at the end and changes the whole meaning of the movie when you know the truth. And the also at the same time is that the truth is what will set you free. And so I pursued my work through beliefs as things grabbed me. And I had several other planned things I wanted to do. And like a child's voice came along in 2017 after the election of Donald Trump, which terrorized me because I believed all the things the media said about him. And I knew that the media lied because they had lied about Bernie Sanders and his supporters too. They smeared Bernie Sanders and their supporters. They tried to keep an even kill balance, you know, for appearance sake, you know, because ultimately his, his role was to fold them all into Clinton. He wasn't gonna fight and take him, take him on like he said he was gonna do. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. But the point being is that I, the kind of mind that I have is I have to get a hold of reality. And I have to understand that when something doesn't make sense, I have to understand why I can't process it. So I'm going to dig at it and try to figure it out. And so I said, I have to figure out how the hell we arrived at Donald Trump being president. You know, is it because it, I, because I can't believe it's just, I mean, even if he is a racist and all these things, I can't believe it's only those things that contributed to him getting elected. And I knew that the Russiagate story from the onset was bullshit. So I had like enough cognitive dissonance awareness to go, okay, I'm gonna start investigating here and I'm gonna start looking at these people and asking, why the hell did you vote for Donald Trump? What, what, who in the media was talking about all these things that I hadn't seen before? And then I started going back and looking at his speeches. The point I'm making is that six months into this, I'm ready, I had already had plans when he got elected. I had had plans with my business partner. We were going to move to Australia to make movies over there. Thank God we didn't do that. I feel bad because I got friends in Australia. They're going through all this horror um, that they never had to deal with. And they're closer to China and they have no barrier of protection. Right. Um, so they're really, you know, it's tyrannical over there. Um, anyway. I started going down the road and I learned about history. I went into every quote conspiracy and really it was just all of the paranormal, all of the strange occurrences, all of the things that did not add up for which were labeled a certain way. And when you just started to just question, like, wait a minute, Pizzagate, New York Times did a write up about this and the way they covered it and the context that they gave, all of these other photos over here, I think if somebody saw these other photos over here from James Alephantis' Instagram, more people would raise some serious questions as to who these people are, what they're saying about children, who they're following on Instagram, the kind of accounts that are on Instagram, the kind of pictures that are from their followers and the people making comments on those pictures as Mouthy Buddha had exposed has now exposed and many other people. And so I, I kept hearing this thing about human trafficking, human trafficking. And I had known about human trafficking. I learned about it 
probably about 10 years ago uh, in a film called Fields of Mudan, which I highly recommend anybody out here. You can find it, I think, on for free. Um, Fields of Mudan is a short film that was made by Steve O. Chang from FSU, Florida State University. I went to the Directors Guild in 2009, I believe it was, and I saw it there and I was weeping because it was the first time. I mean, the audience was stunned at how authentic and real and tragic and horrific. And he did it with no gra graphic you know, imagery. It was just sound and the idea that you saw an 11-year-old girl, a 9-year-old girl, a 7-year-old girl, a 5-year-old girl, and a 4-year-old girl. And all I haven't seen that film. Walking, yeah, the businessmen walk in and there's a madam there procuring these these girls and they're raped yeah, the ones that tortured. really got me were uh open secret yeah secret and yep. the rape of two Corys. those were the ones that really showed me um you know from the entertainment industry mm -hmm. perspective and i definitely experienced a lot myself growing up where i can tell like you know a lot of this goes on there's actually been some situations where i could have easily been dragged into it if i hadn't mm -hmm. you know really use my intelligence to not go with it. So um, well, and, and that's important, it but that's important to d distinguish because when people hear that, they go, well, what are you talking about? You mean you did, you knew this was going, no, you don't realize, look, I, I was a 22 year old man going to Hollywood with my ideas in he in my head of the understanding of the world that I had at that time. And, um, I had no idea what I was walking into in terms of the, the totality and reality of it. I just saw it from my level of consciousness and my my awareness. And so when you're talking about that, like even if you had, quote, you could have turned, there were people that I could have gone with that would have just ended in my death or I would have had to have been as satanic as they were. I mean, I had a girl, there was a 22 year old girl that I met. She looked like a model. She was on the phone with me one day and this tells you how crazy I was to even be talking to her, but I didn't even know it was, I could not conceive of what she was saying to me at 27 or 28 when she told me that, oh, yeah, my girlfriend and I, we were just thinking about going to Vegas next week and picking up a hooker and killing her and taking her out in the desert and burying her body. What? And that would be fun. That would be something that's fun to do. Wow. I had another really actor. Serious? I had an actress, uh, an actor warned me about an actress that I had interviewed for a role years ago. And he said, I was in an acting class with her and she literally created, she worked on a list of 20 ways to kill somebody without getting caught. And she was dead serious about making that list. For what reason and purpose, I don't know. But the fact that somebody's thinking about that consciously and working on it and writing it and contemplating it is a problem. But anyway, I say that because these are obvious things, but why I'm telling you is you don't, you don't have that experience yet to know the danger of what everything is and is not because you haven't seen it at that level before. Mm -hmm. And an evil out there, man, it looks really good, doesn't it? It's got all the shininess, the bells and whistles, the girls, the booze, the lifestyle, the cars, the houses. And like what, what better position, someone that would want to be able to like have the ability to really control these children's lives and like you know these parents basically selling their children off to these people that come yes. in positions in the, in the entertainment industry because you know like parents like you know like me for example i came out into the industry from the midwest and it's like you know a lot a lot of people like i, I went in through barbizon modeling and acting school but like a lot of you know parents in the midwest will send their children out here for any sort of project thinking like oh my child's going to be a star and um basically you know they are like selling their children straight to these people who are like vultures i mean like mm -hmm. really that's the kind of personality that gets attracted to these positions in the entertainment business and that's not to say that everyone in the entertainment business right. is these kind of people but they're not they're uh, not those, i want to be very clear i yeah. have talked with many dozens of people especially you know we can talk about this later but the viral video that i did last august that has now been seen estimated 80 to 100 million people worldwide. When I was talking about the censorship of our movie, 
on Instagram. And the, uh, I went in, I just, whatever flowed out of me that day, that 38 minute thing, if you haven't seen it yet, definitely look it up. YouTube deleted most of the copies. It's on BitChute. Um, you can look at, uh, I think it was like Hollywood producer calls out, you know, or whatever. Uh, but you can look up my name, but I just kind of laid it all out for people. Um, it's, it's just the weirdest thing because I had such high hopes as a young person, you know, dreams, you have real dream. There's your dream. And, and the thing is the dream is not in the institution. It's you, you're the real thing, not them. So if you're like a filmmaker and you're sitting there or like an actor going, Oh, I hate my industry. I can't work in it. It's like, go create, go create. Don't wait on these people. Like, first of all, it's like this. There are decent people who don't do any of this crap. What happens is this, in, in the general sense, is that um, people go to Los Angeles as it's advertised. I mean, Entourage was a advertisement for the Hollywood entertainment industry. If you're a young man and you wanted to seek hot women and be a star and you know play in that crazy world, it brought a lot of men out to Los Angeles and, uh, and I'm sure women too, in a different way. I, I, I don't, it's not a judgment. It's just different ways you look at things. Um, but the thing is, is like the reality and the people there, it's like the more, the higher up you go, the more sociopathic it gets the more ruthless it gets when I mean, you're like, and, and the thing is, is like everybody is vying for power and money and power and money. Every play, every single play, there is it's no, like there's so many talented people, but you don't really get into this you club unless you are that kind of person no, and, and with that group of people. It doesn't matter how thing, much talent you have. Yes, it, it, it is. Talent is an illusion there because they tell you who's talented and who's not. Right. Definitely. So, right. So the thing is, is like, and, and, you know, I've heard every side of every argument from the antigens, the managers, this and that, and the other. And I'm just like looking at it and going, yeah, you all are allowing this to happen too. I mean, you can see it clearly with the music, the music industry. Yes. I mean, it's like the people who have the top songs right now. You can't tell me that WAP is the top song in the world. That's what they're saying is the top song in the world. Oh, That's not what people have actually elections. want to listen to. We have rigged elections, a rigged financial system. Uh, wh what else do you want? Rigged healthcare, university system, job capitalism what i'm not coming off of capitalism i'm just talking about predatory capitalism that's a big effing difference but oh but we and we have rigged sports and college football and everything you know it's like oh this is the one sacred place <laughs> with the most ethical group of people that's going to tell you the truth <laughs> right I mean, at fake. the end of the day, the answer to chairs of boards, they see you all as consumers, nothing more. Fans are cult worship in their world, and you will see all of that and more unfold over the next several years because they are going to reap what they have sown and seeded in the minds of tens of millions of people. And the only thing you can do is you use your voice to create the world that you want to live in, and you go and make that world possible where love dwells where there's a higher trust society, that community that you create, you create it. The world doesn't just magically manifest this. I love that you're saying that because that's what I'm trying to do right now in Hollywood is I've kind of got a group together of like other kind of like-minded individuals. And we're like, so this is all going on, but why can't we just start creating our own thing? So that's kind what? of where like fake checkers came out. That's what you met me through was uh, fake checkers. But um, yeah, yeah it was, and it's been hard to get a crew of people together that are all kind of, you know, like-minded individuals that, right. you know, it, it's hard to find in Hollywood. I mean, everyone's very... You know, it's hard to, yeah, they're very, and, well, they have yeah. tunnel vision, right? And if you're not in that, you know, you're not an asset to that. They don't see outside of the tunnel vision. Most of them, not all, but a lot, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, you know, they're driven and all that. But that's, that's the thing that, that, that's why 
see, what makes that Sodom and Gomorrah work is that everybody comes out there seeking something. Many people, now, that doesn't mean an artist is wrong to go to L.A. Let me be very clear. But the majority <laughs> are seeking something psychological that is not through creation. It's through control, position of power, status, fame, money, social status, material wealth, you know, that kind of, the, the, the hyper-sexualized materials culture, that candidate that's the atheist with a lot of money who wants to just go poking his dick around in a bunch of holes, you are a prime candidate for Hollywood. And a lot of people go there because it's not, it's the big league, right? It's the world. The world comes to play there. And so the big time players, the people that have big dreams and big ambitions, I'm not talking about like, I'm not taking a shot at business people whatsoever. But like, there's got to be a line that you can't cross at a certain point. You know, and, 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 and you, see, here's the, this is why we're artists are open people, which means they're highly sensitive, which usually indicates, and it doesn't always, it doesn't mean what a lot of people take it as, which is, you know, they feel shame and guilt, which is not. But if you have trauma or you come from some form of dysfunction, it doesn't have to be horrific and, and all that, but you that's the, the odds are high for creation in that direction and so you didn't become a lawyer you didn't become a doctor you didn't become an accountant or a nurse or a banker or any of that you wanted to go out and create out of imagination and because that energy is there it can suck you into it because of all of your unconscious behavior from the past is fully enabled there you will see things that you've never seen before. You will see drugs you've never seen before. You will see people doing drugs like you've never seen before. <laughs> you, will, you will see people doing babar, uh, you know, just, just behavior that is just, I'll, I'll sum it in one, to like one thing. There was a 22-year-old stripper that I spoke with uh, in 2019. She had worked two years in, I think, New York, one in Chicago, and she'd been six months in Los Angeles. And she said, I have never seen more people willing to do whatever it takes to make money than the people who live here. I can tell you, I've definitely experienced that myself. I've seen that all firsthand with people out here. I, I don't ver really go out very much. I mean, I witnessed a lot of this, like right when I moved out to LA about seven years ago, mm -hmm. definitely witnessed a lot of wild things, a lot of wild people. And I can definitely attest to that. And it's sad. I remember at one point I, I met this girl who was like two years into like being in LA and probably about five years ago, six years ago. And there was this girl who was from Chicago and I'm from Illinois, not Chicago, mm -hmm. but I met her at this uh, party that was kind of like this Playboy Mansion type house. They had like a grotto and everything. And I was like, oh, you're from Illinois too. And she's like, oh, wow. So you just, you came out here recently. And she's like, are you corrupted yet? <laughs> and I just like, I'm like, no, and I'm not going to be. <laughs> and like, it's just kind of funny to me. I always think about that moment. And, you know, it's, it's definitely hard to stay a sovereign individual in a place like this. I can definitely see how people can get dragged down easily. And yeah, I can definitely attest to that. Yeah. Well, it, and, and here's the thing. It's like, so you have your friends and you got the people that have still have a love for movies and making film. And that's really what it's got to, got to have it, it, it. Let me make it a bit more clear to any artists out there in this time, thinking that you're going to make your way up through that structure. You will pay your soul for it. Period. That there, you're not going to be the, the, the white knight and shining. So what I'm saying is instead of hating it and, um, you know, hating the world, rejecting it, that's actually perfect for them because you then destroy your imagination and creation. You throw it away. So you have to take the imagination and creation, meaning you have to embrace your limitations and scale and build to scale. So 
No, you may not get the you know five hundred thousand dollar or the one million or two million on your first feature, but go out there and prove yourself in stages. There's a whole world out there. Four billion people right now have access to the internet, and you just need to get a hundred thousand of them singing your praises. That's it, and you'll have a career if that's what you want. But if you want the fame and you want all that other bullshit that illusion, go for it. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I have my own experiences, my own opinion. I drew a hard line. Here's, here's what I'm gonna tell you, each and every one of you filmmakers out there, you artists, okay? Any industry that allows children to be sexually abused, turn a blind eye and take a fucking check has your name on it. When, when, when the Me Too movement started, I went to my female actress friends from the Bernie Sanders campaign. These are names. People that you would see in movies. I, I mentioned this before. I don't say their name because I don't need that attention and I don't want that on them because they have to answer for their own actions and their behaviors and the choices that they have made, like I have. But I said when they were organizing rallies on Facebook, to go, you know, for me too. I said, and the children, don't forget about the children. And they said, I know, I know. And that woman, let me just be very clear. That woman had a child who is an actress in Hollywood today. So when there is a mother with a child who is willing to allow to be silent on that, that's when I said, I'm sorry. You at this point, have made your decision and and she did not speak out now here's the other side of it and that's why I, these things are complicated i mean I, I mean that in not right and wrong and being you know no we're not talking about moral relativism here what i'm saying is that what most people don't understand is that your whole life has been built among an, in an industry for which you have according to how you feel and what you think is right, have made certain concessions or agreements. Let's call them agreements. That these are the way things are, and this is how I'm going to, to deal with it, and this is how I'm going to live my life, and, and I'll just kind of keep myself in that space. And because I know that the people, and then they see what happens to the people who speak out. They're blacklisted. They're blacklisted. So. So it's like this, you get far enough along in your career, you come to realize that there are these horrific things and you wanna do your work and you've got kids and you've got a mortgage and you've got college and all these other things and what are you gonna do? You're gonna just go, okay, I am today renouncing all of this, walking away. You'd say yes, but until you're in that situation, doesn't mean that they're right in terms of allowing all these other things to happen. I'm just trying to describe in, without standing in their shoes and in their mind, but what they could be experiencing, because this was the truth about many uh, academic uh, professors who were trying to tell people about all of this totalitarian leftism that was coming. They couldn't speak out about it because they would totally be outed. I mean, they'd be blacklisted, they'd lose everything that they had built their entire careers around. So I, I just want people to understand it's multidimensional that, that keep those pressures in place, but they've got a good tight grip, believe me, to keep everybody. A lot in of mind. times they'll even compromise them with like videos of them at parties or like with different people yes. and things yes. like that too. So Well, I, I mean, when you, when you enter a world that is, that mocks Jesus Christ. Okay. Look, I, I tell people like, look, um, you may not, you, you hear that and you go, Oh, don't 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 try to sell me. Know that the people who worship the dark gods and lords of the universe and channel that power mock Christ. And there is a reason why, because the essence and power of that is the only thing that can overcome the darkness that these people wage war on. Now, you can be a spiritual person and I am, but I'm just saying you don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to follow the dogmatic ideological, you know, brainwashing that goes on. I'm talking about the words of Christ, the four gospels, just read them 
and know that they are the truth of the whole full human being because everything else is a contradiction. Everything else that is anti-human, that turns you away from yourself. And here's the ultimate reality for me. Every single human being born on this planet, 7.9 billion of us, were born with eternal love in our hearts when we first came into this world. And that has been, that is before all of the troubles began, before you begin paying taxes, have a career, have to figure out the world and education and navigate all that. What I'm saying to you is that child, that child's essence and love is what we all need to start returning back to for the world of play, the world of curiosity, the, the world of wonder, the world of discovery, the magnificence and preciousness that is available to us with, with science telling you it's there, with paranormal activity telling you it's there, with supernatural you know, things happening to tell you there. And, and here's the thing, it's not outside of you. It's the God essence within you that keeps you alive, that all of the, these things that are going on, the blood and the flow and the beats and the brain and the verd, blah, 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 is a complex quantum computing machine organism, bioorganism that is resonant. It has a high vibrational energy that comes from the heart. It's a magnetic field, a torus that when you live in fear, it's only six feet outside of you. When, you, when you're in that heart-led emotion, that loving emotion, you can literally feel it, you get warm, it begins to spread everywhere. It begins to raise everything up. We are beings, we are spirit and matter for which we are, we are brought here for something. I don't know the whole concept, but I can tell you that one of them is to bring into manifestation creation in the light, to lighten the world, to enlighten the world, to take our manifestations of creation in matter as an extension of the eternal universe that dwells within us and is all around us and harmonizing with that through love. And you, here's a very practical way it plays out in real life. Your grandmother's cooking. Now, some people may have shitty grandmother's cooking, but most people love their grandmother's cooking. And the thing that you're tasting, or when you go to a restaurant that has the same type of food as another restaurant, but it has a different flavor, you are feeling that vibration coming forward in complex systems, but it all is manifesting through the hands and the vibrational energy in the brain and the mind and the heart is manifesting that energy in matter it's giving life to it that is full and and is an extension of who you are it's a creation it's a creation from within you Definitely. what we have is a system that educates you through steps to train you how to be just enough competent to go serve the corporation not give you an education on how to think for yourself not how to create and be an entrepreneur. They don't teach you where money comes from, how it's used, how wealth is created. They don't tell you about passive income and capital gains and how you, you, meet, you work your way up. They teach you economics and finance so that you can go and compute, com compute all the taxes for the one-tenth of one percent and all their subsidiaries because that's the real world. That's what these people will tell you. You don't understand what the real world is like. No, I don't understand your insane world, but you have a certain collective insanity for which you participate and yet have cognitive dissonance to ignore the reality of your actions or the ones that are not directly involved, but indirectly involved. And you don't seem to care because that's business. That's the cost of doing business. When they get lawsuits on these major corporations, like, let's say banks, right? Banks doing these fraud. I mean, you can go back in time. Look at this, back to 2008 and before. Anytime a bank has been caught and they pay a fine, go look at their portfolio in relation to the fine that they paid. It's a cost of doing business. It's a cost of doing that. It's, we made 12 billion, we had to pay 800 million out. We made $11.2 billion. 
that's how they see it, guys. You cannot understand the way that that structure is entangled with everything else. That's why when people look and go, what are we going to do? There is no savior for the system. Believe me. There is no way to save the old way, the old paradigm, because it is built. It wasn't built for you and me. It was an illusion of our reality, which our belief in it gave it life and meaning. And we followed it with all the merits of the structure built in, you know, going to school, getting to college, you know, you do all those things. And then you have, you know, people go, you got a liberal arts degree, you got $100,000 in debt. What are you going to do? It's all your screwed up problems. And look at the liberal arts. They're totally whacked out. It's like all of that was created. All of that was done. Yeah, You know, as an artist, I never really felt like I fit into that system as a cog. I don't know. To me, it's just like I could always like see through. I could see how it was indoctrinating like kids. Like I, I graduated high school in 2012 and I could know. I don't know if it, how it was like, you know, previously, but definitely around that time, I could see how they were kind of indoctrinating all the students to just kind of follow this like very left ideology ideology and i could see through and it really bothered me and i actually never really went to college i just kind of started working as an actor in the entertainment industry and making my art and i actually i mean sometimes i'm like oh maybe i should have gone but a lot i when i look back on it i feel like i'm doing much better than a lot of people i know my age just from going straight into the industry and creating and you know i like what you're saying about creating um that that's all about creation you know like focusing on how we can create a better world instead of just going with the system that's been set up because you know that's that's really what the difference is and i i feel like um the the old system is obviously breaking down in so many ways i mean we're seeing it very clearly this year and it's like um you know it, it's definitely going to be a focus on how are we going to rebuild i mean it's like people are waiting for this external factor of like how yeah. is society like like they just want everything to be like laid out for them and it's like no we have to come together and create yeah. a new system yes. that's yes. the only way we're going to move forward in a positive yeah. way this is the thing i i i'm glad you brought this up if i can make this point um it, it may be, i'll try to make it short oh go ahead <laughs> but the forces at work today in the world come from not only an old way of thinking but from a certain group of people who are psychopathic sociopathic and narcissistic in their impulses and drives to to in other words their belief system is their belief system there isn't any changing them okay so you can't reason with somebody who's a sociopath and a psychopath or a narcissist period it's just it's impossible nearly impossible um and you can't trust somebody like that no matter what they tell you my god um so when when we're talking about like you know building a new world what a lot of people get stuck on is going where do i start where what do i do you know because there's so many problems in the world and they go well what problem do you want to solve well there's like 10 of them okay we'll stack rank order them right and 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 here's where people get lost they go into activism you know because it feels good you get a, you get around you finally found your tribe you found your group you're all excited and passionate about this issue you've you've seen the injustice done and you are going to make it known you're going to make your presence known and you're going to you're going to get people signed up on lists and you're going to hold rallies and you're going to hold marches and you're going to hold signs and you're going to do all this activism and then the election will come around and then we got to vote for somebody because that person is saying the things that we've been fighting for for the last four years and haven't been able to get anywhere because we've been running around but we've done our job we've done our part we've raised the consciousness guys and now we got to keep going because there's another enemy to be fought there's a there's a group out there that is causing more havoc by just the effect of them being there and we've got to stand our, our ground and demand that these things get done. And your politicians are taking money from all of these people. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
It's the most cynical thing in the world, and you have to avoid it because you're because it's not fighting. It's what Buckminster. Let me. I do want to bring this up because I want to get this quote right, and I want people to look this man up. Um, some of some of you will take with him, and others maybe not. But Buckminster Fuller, okay, and that's a name that is known throughout history. But Buckminster Fuller said very simply: "You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something." You must build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So what does that mean? That means it's your ideas, your creation, your imagination that can create. Because let me just say this. This is as good as it gets with these people. The current group in there and the ones that are running things, this is as good as it gets. This is what they do when there is a virus with a 99.6% survival rate and 30 billionaires make off with 2 trillion in new wealth last year while 150 million worldwide are slipping into extreme poverty of that 100 million children they are estimating 100 million children will die in the next several years because of all of the starvation and the malnourishment and the impoverishment and then these monsters want to come back when i say monsters who do this through the bureaucracy the imf the world bank and the bis they sit at the very very top of the pyramid they're all in geneva including the united nations all of the hell is in geneva okay that's the central place where all the shit comes from and they're and they're polished they are smart the swiss i mean it's you just you don't know what you're up against. They've been perfecting this model since, I want to say since 1045. I could be wrong. When I say 1045, I mean 1045. Something like a thousand years ago, they, they created the first central bank, which was a castle, a fortified castle that went out and sent armies out into the lands to gather all the taxes and gold. And they did so by force. And then they brought it all back to the central place and they stored it there. This is going on for a long, long time, and the bill is coming And there's due. a central banking system in almost every country now besides, yeah. was it Iran and, or Iran and uh, North Iran, Korea? Iran, uh, there were a couple of countries. Now, right? Libya tried to resist them. Libya wanted to go to its own gold-backed currency and start trading outside of dollars, and that's why they killed Gaddafi. Uh, and it's like those are the only countries we're ever like at war with now. And, yeah, all the ones know. that we're at war with are not done because they're uh there's wealth and resources there that's all it is and it and by taking out the leadership whether it's corrupt or not is not the issue those wealth and resources hold together a hell of a lot of a i mean like those are interconnected pieces it's like if you just shut off the economy tomorrow what would happen everything would fail across all systems so that's where these monsters went in, they took Gaddafi out, and they opened a slave trade market right there. The human trafficking of Africans. I mean, so so we can go on and on about all this shit, but what I'm what the point I'm making is that for every negative thing that you look at, every dark marker you see, there is an equal and opposite point in the light that exists. You have yet to see it. But Here's what I would tell people, and this is where it gets into trauma and a lot of other things that have been or been shaken up in people over the last four years. There's a purpose for this, and I'm going to talk about well, There's so many angles we can go on this. I'm going to try to focus it, though, on things that can help people. So if you consider you've lived your life, you know, from before, and it's come all the way to this moment right now. <laughs> And collectively, you've had billions of people all come along the same way and arrive here with you right now. Now, so, one-tenth of one percent doing all this horrific shit to us. All of us have lived these lives, and we are all dealing with them uniquely, individually, across multiple dimensions. What does that mean? That means that in 2021, when you're facing down a failed government, 
a failed global system, a failed monetary system, a failed education system. I mean, you just go down all the lists. Okay, okay. We have arrived at this moment because collectively and individually, we have co-created our realities together. And here's how you know what that means. When you vote for a politician in the past who speaks to you, he, was all, he or she was always telling you to vote for them to have so that our children can have a better future, which who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want that for their own child? But those same people playing politicians on the stage also know that there is a human trafficking pipeline of $150 billion a year in an ever-growing industry of pornography and consumption of child pornography material. And then you have leaders of your institutions in banking, education, government, Hollywood, the media, health, and anywhere else you want to go, law enforcement, military, all of it, participating in that pipeline. How can you vote for a future for your children that coexists with human trafficking of two and a half to four million children a year? of which most don't live past age seven. We have 500 to 800,000 children a year before COVID going missing. And yet 96% of Americans have cell phones and we have geo, we have technology and surveillance on a level unparalleled in any time in history and 500 to 800,000 children go missing every year. That is unacceptable in a society that values human life. That you well, isn't like it the head of the um what's the emergency broadcasting system for like human traffic children amber I alert yeah the the head of amber alert they were actually caught laura in the middle Silsby. of human trafficking yes laura silsby it's was the the real story uh at the beginning of the wikileaks things had to do with laura silsby and how clinton bill clinton used his influence to get her off of charges of human trafficking by bringing in I don't remember the exact number of the children because I read this in 2017, but it was anywhere between 17 and 30 some odd children being brought into the United States from Haiti after the earthquake when the Clinton Foundation had gone down there. That's who she worked for. She chartered, you know, got chartered flights, these kids out of the country without proper paperwork. So nobody knew that they were in the country and nobody knew that they were what they were doing and what they were there for. It's like when you just look at that, it's like, so did they make this whole system to just know if like anyone like finds out, you know, where these children are going, then they will like move them or something? Like yes. Well, that gets into a whole other thing. And um, I don't I don't. I've seen how dark it gets. I've seen the videos. I've seen stuff that I, I could only look at one time. I've read things that have turned my stomach. I don't advise going down these rabbit holes for the majority of people because, as, I, as I've said to others before in the truth community, you have tens of millions of mothers in this country who would drop to their knees and cry their eyes out and vomit. Uh, if they knew the reality of what had been going on for decades. You know, that's what's so important about talking about all of this, though. And in, in my opinion, I've just noticed that if you even bring up the idea of child human trafficking, if you bring it up in conversation, people immediately want to back away and want nothing to do with it. And it's like to a majority of people, it's such an awful topic that they don't yeah. even want to like think about it. And that's the problem. That's why this isn't being so, an issue that's being shared worldwide as much as it should be because people don't even want to think about it because it's so horrible but it's our yes it is and it's our issue though that's really what is important to think about this because here here's here's where this is all going you want to change the world you want to see a different world and you want to affect it in whatever way that you can whether it's one per look you're Every single person alive today is someone to someone else. You matter to someone else. When you're a child, you don't care if your parents are poor. You don't understand poverty. You don't love them any less. A child doesn't love their parents any less because they're poor or because they're not super smart. And maybe when you get older, you might have some certain opinions as a teenager and all that. Fine. But I'm talking about a child. 
We have within us all the creation forces to transform the world. And I don't mean it in some highfalutin way or like, you know, motivational speech. It's like, damn it, you have the power of imagination and creation and the world is convinced you that it doesn't exist, that it doesn't have any power. And the truth of the matter is, is like, this, this human trafficking issue, the reason why it is coming into consciousness at such a high level now is because it actually mirrors our own internal traumas, a lot of them. This is a child abuse system. This system, when I tell people this, I would be very clear and concise. What these people do to children they do to each and every single one of us. If they groom and condition children, they groom and condition you to believe they're bullshit. And they will blame you like a psychopath does. They will say, you wanted it, you deserved it, you asked for it, that was your consent. That's the lie they have to tell in order to fulfill their bullshit. So flip side of that is, and this is the part we have yet to face, but we need to begin to look this way. And I will give you clear places to get, get information so that you can make your own choices, but this is the one I've come to at this time. What we do to our children, we do to ourselves and everyone else. When you abuse that child inside the privacy of your home, for which there are no police, and no neighbors or strangers present to be able to observe what you are doing to that child. You put fear in that child in any which way, that child is going to do one of two things. In its immediate needs, the child, when abused, will suppress its true feelings because the child cannot conceive of evil. The child cannot conceive that the mother and father would ever hurt it, and it will blame itself and carry that blame, shame, and guilt for the rest of its life. And if you do it frequently enough, it's not evenly distributed. Every single person on this planet lives in their own unique reality, both in the mind as shaped according to how they experienced it, on both a conscious and unconscious level. Spirit in matter with friction changes the dynamic of everyone's life. It makes us whole and unique simultaneously. It is the real diversity. The real diversity is the celebration of each individual's own uniqueness for which there is infinite manifestations of those expressions. When you get into your meaning and your truth or however you want to define it, but I, I will go straight to the core of what it is. This is a heart-centered place for which the world does not give you the answer for. The world will, div will offer you all that there is a void in you to take you further away from yourself. That's not to hate and reject the world. It's to reverse the flow, which is it has to do with all of the lines that you will not cross. You say you have integrity. You need to speak to that integrity. Your actions need to follow the integrity that you live in your heart. Everything that you create must come take all that you've learned in this time and put it together. What does it mean? What is, what is, what is human trafficking, child abuse, pedophilia, and all this other stuff mean? It means that there is enormous amounts of abuse in the world that created many, many pedophiles. What created the pedophile? I can tell you, I can give you a clue. A pedophile is someone that identifies sexually and emotionally with a child, an underage child, a child that has not had sex or is sexually active. You can say under 18, but I'm going right to the core issue of young children, single digit age children, which the media will never cover until it's full blown. 
because that would end everything. You wouldn't be able to excuse it. Only the sickest people uh, would defend it. And there will be, there will be, believe me. When that time comes, there will be people who defend it and oh my God, you've never seen the hell that will be in store for them. Um, because even most criminal people, if you've abused children, the, all the people who are criminals, they were all abused as children. And so anybody who abuses children, that is the line that they draw and they will kill that person in prison. They will find a way to kill them because that person is the person who deserves it when it was the parent that did that to that child who's now in jail as an adult and he's finally got a reason to get it out on somebody who deserves it, who's right in front of him, who's a piece of shit in his world. So, but pedophiles have no adults who love them healthy. They're children who were subjected to horrific abuse, whether they remember it or not. And they identify with children because they are that wounded child. That's not an excuse. That's not even a reason to, it's an understanding that why they do what they do is because they were made that way. No child, like look, no child, no infant, you can't tell me that there is any infant out there who would consciously think that's what I want. No. If you don't consciously come to those, I knew a guy, let me, let me give reference to this. I knew a guy out in LA, I uh, talked with about a month ago, was on his show, and he knew Kevin Spacey in, in school, in grade school. He knew Kevin Spacey at eight, nine, 10 years old. And the things he told me, I'm not gonna repeat them here, he feels bad. He feels bad. This guy, knowing full well the whole totality of everything we're talking about here, he feels bad for Kevin Spacey. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't feel bad. Like, he feels horrible about the, the victims. This is not about, oh, we need to think about No. What he's saying is that Kevin Spacey, when he was a, a little boy, he played with him. And he saw his happiness and his beauty. He also saw this darkness, too. That was because of his father, which his brother, Kevin Spacey's brother, has talked about how horrific that man was. So what we have is we, we are separated from you know, Hollywood and government and all of this. And it's like, no, no, no. Ghislaine Maxwell was able to go into West Palm Beach at a trailer park a stranger to girls, a stranger walked into a trailer park home community and was able to offer alcohol, drugs, and money to lure these girls away and they went. Now, that's not an indictment or judgment against those women. What I'm saying is we need to realize that if strangers can walk into a place and offer one of those three things and our children will walk with them, we are not doing our job as parents. We are not raising strong, healthy-minded children who have a, a love in them that does not allow them to betray themselves. And, and this child abuse issue, it goes very deep because it's, it's, it is slapping, it is spanking, it is beating. You don't sit there, like, I, I get these arguments from parents all the time. It's like, well, you know, I went through it and just like, yeah, and were you happy? Are you, are you, um, were, did you love your mother that much more? I mean, the, the, the thing is, is like, no, I needed that. Well, yeah, but who raised you? It's like, it's what like, what would you say would be the alternative to people like I said, like, oh, if I can't speak to my kid or what you, know, you have, you, and what would you also consider, like, what's the fine line between like abuse and like, you know, discipline, a reasonable form. what you call yeah. discipline? Well, yeah, here, like, you know, it's like thing. putting someone's nose in the corner. Is that too much? That's humiliation. Or, you know. I mean, people do it. I'm just saying, look at the results. Look at the society. Let me put it in a broader perspective for people who think that they're immune to all of this and hearing this. Look at our society today, okay? It's a collective insane insane show it's a freak show and and 
you all may laugh at it and think it's crazy. You know, it's going to have long-term consequences that we have not seen play out yet over this is first generation. Well, it's really been in the, it's, it's been on its way here, but this is the first generation of our awareness. You haven't seen the kids that were born in 2010, what they're going to become. And so why I'm saying what I'm telling you is this is all interrelated. So if you make any, like, it's like this, the parents that beat their children saying, that's my child. I even get the ones that go, uh, I brought you into this world. I can take you out of it. What the hell are you talking about? You're putting fear into the heart of a child that loves you, even when they're bad. So what happens is, is as parents keep beating their kids or disciplining them, the child doesn't matter what you say. It's what you really mean by what you do. They can feel that. So if you're getting your shit out on your kids because you're mad and you want to beat them and it gives you some power, you need to take a check. You need to check yourself. You should feel really bad to hit your child. You should. You should feel really bad that, let me just tell you another way. If that was an adult, try that shit on them and see what happens when they can fight back. Then you'll know the strength of what you're doing to someone. And you can maybe have some self-awareness. There's a lot of people that don't want to hear that crap, but I'm going to tell you as somebody who went through horrific abuse as a child, you don't know the lasting scars that you are leaving imprinted in your child's mind for which they will develop that in and integrate it into their personality and seek out someone unconsciously who also is abusive. That's why women and men who are abusive that stay together, stay together because they're familiar with it. They've been through it already. They're re-traumatized by it. And of course, fighting, which worked when they were little or when they didn't fight when they were little and they try to fight when it's later, it doesn't work. So these addictions, look, what is coming for humanity? I don't know how it ends, but all I'm going to tell you is this. Last year, during COVID, forget about all the whole movie of COVID and just go with what was the net effect of COVID. The highest rates ever of suicide, the highest rates ever of suicide in children, such to the point that the Las Vegas school system had to reopen when they didn't want to, you know, because they were afraid of the virus but because so many kids were killing themselves at home. The highest rates ever of addiction, binge drinking, alcoholism, obesity, lack of exercise. I mean, diet to shit. You have people who are um, homeless for the first time have lost every illusion that they had before four years ago. They never imagined that their lives would be this way now out of no fault of their own. You have a, a hot spikes in human trafficking, child abuse, domestic violence, homicide, drug overdoses, more than COVID combined, way more. Yeah. And this is you know what's interesting. The mass that's an easy way to hide a child that's being human trafficked is just put a mask on them. And you know, a lot of people can't tell. You know, they could someone that's like trafficking a child, they could just bring them right out in public and be like holding right. them. I actually have seen a ton of articles come out about this happening yeah. recently. Like, they just noticed the way someone was holding a child while they were in public with them. And when they pulled back the mask, they were like actually like duct tapes over their mouths. And that's it's, uh, look, look, the, the, the thing is, is that you cannot un stop the unfolding of what is going on in collectively and individually in people. And, you know, I, I've heard a lot of people talk about, Oh, these people are stupid. They're programmed. They're dumb. Let me tell you something. When you start going down that road of declaring gener general populations of people on a value system, 
They are that is social engineering on a level you have yet to understand because what that means is you're already beginning to feel that way about other people in relation to you as they feel that way about you. And what that's going to do is it's taking two unconscious groups of people and creating tribalism. And first it's in words. And then when words break down and dialogue breaks down, then it becomes violent. And you have, uh, uh, you know, this is why I'm urging people to really wake the hell up to the reality of what, who and what you are in the face of all of these people who have betrayed you, lied to you, told you you're worthless through their policies. I mean, it doesn't matter where, you know, what your feelings are about them. That is not going to change the reality of what we're living in. How this is all going to play out, I don't know. But I can see where it can be used to cause harm to a lot of people. It can be used because the system doesn't have an answer to solve the emotional and mental traumas of the individuals who are suffering. That's why they can't make it out of survival mode and out of poverty. You can call them lazy, yes, but there's nobody. Let me tell you what made them lazy. There was no one in their life, except if you're a narcissist, I can kind of understand that you just got you. This person, I can't deal with them because they just won't listen. But I'm talking about anybody else. Go to them. Go to them. Go to the people who need you the most, who need unconditional love the most, and who are willing to receive it. Give it to them. In this time, love is contagious. It will spread everywhere when it's given. It's a connecting point. It's a node on a network. It's another reassurance, a reaffirmation in the face of all the shit going on on television and in our media and in our politics and our theater for which everybody is just like going in and re-traumatizing themselves daily watching this shit show. It's like, you can't do anything about it. This is their world. And here's the thing, guys. You're letting them live rent-free in your mind throughout the day and as you sleep. And you know, what's so interesting is that if you shut all that off, if you don't watch TV, if you are not constantly checking these headlines, you don't even experience any of it. It's like everything's completely fine. Right. <laughs> I noticed yeah. that I kind of got caught up in that after the whole Capitol fiasco. Um, I was kind of, you know like a lot i was watching the news just to kind of see what was going on with everything mm -hmm. and i definitely started getting caught up in it and i like i really was like to the point where i was like having a meltdown i'm like okay i just need to like yeah. back off from all this and it was just so crazy how you could get from the state of being caught up in that and then like how it feels to just ignore it all and then you're everything's fine <laughs> it yeah. was just it's crazy it is. It, it's a. It's a mind. It's a mind game um, that they play on us, and it's. It's got. It's. It's all theater. I, I mean, I look at the media as just. Just actors. Um, I'm not even talking about you know the corruption and all that. I'm just talking about, they're actors to control, the the illusion of the reality that they're projecting onto us, so that so that it doesn't look like it's failing. It looks like everything is fine and all is going well and, and these are the issues of the day and this is what we have to deal with and these are the battles that are being fought of he said, she said, and all that. And it's like they, but here's the thing, what's, what's, what's really going to, you know, what you all have to understand is that the next two to four years, no matter what happens, elections not, um, these are revenge elections. These are going to pull in some of the most die in the wool, you know, die hard, partisan, entrenched individuals because um, they created they created a cult. Uh, they created a cult in the Trump supporter or the American patriot, whatever you want to call them. It's like a cult on both sides. It's right. Crazy. So they they but see, this is how they 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 work the game is they create through identity politics. So. I'm just giving you like a like a flavor of their their method. So you always have a victim class, right? An oppressed class of people. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a large percentage or a small percentage. It's something that 
Um, well, it's usually tied into the transhumanist agenda, but but in this case, like trans people, trans transgender. Now, I, I want to qualify this completely before I start. This is nothing to do with a transgender per person. This has to do with an agenda that they are sowing concepts into people's minds that take root through emotion. And so when, when you get an imprint, information into people's emotional, like when they're in a suggestible state, when they're in a highly attuned and suggestible state, whether it be in fear, fear is the biggest one, that's always what they use, but emotion of compassion or empathy, they utilize those things to brainwash you and imprint so that anytime you see transgender or LGBTQ, you know it's good. No matter what it is that's being said or done, you know that it's good. And I'll give you the perfect, my friend, 44 years old, uh, academic mind of a high level, super organized, compassionate, caring. I show her not right-wing articles. Here's a young boy twerking in a circle of gay men at a parade with who are all holding beer around them. Now you go, well, this is among men. Just change it to a girl. And the same thing. Is that appropriate? Is that what a child who is 100% a sponge at that age how he is processing that in relation to your messaging is entirely different. Amazing Desmond's mother put him on a live stream with Michael Almog, the party monster, and they were talking about ketamine and drugs. That same child is championed on Good Morning America for families at breakfast as they're getting their day started when they bring him out in a dress in an audience, he's literally crawling and acting seductive and submissive as an 11-year-old boy playing a woman. And the audience is cheering. And the hosts of GMA, Good Morning Mara, are cheering. The same, same group, ABC News, by the way, I want to put this full circle for anybody who doesn't understand the agenda at hand here. Good Morning America is ABC News. ABC News is owned by Disney. ABC News was the outlet with Amy Robach, who in 2016 had Virginia Guffrey's entire, entire evidence, all the names, all of the sources checked out, they had gone through it for months to bring her story, and they killed it because the royal family had a problem with it and the network still wanted to keep its access. That's what they told her. Amy Robach, let me just tell you who these people are. Amy Robach, go and watch it. It's on Project Veritas. I don't care what you think about Project Veritas. Go watch that video and tell me that that woman has any fucking remorse for the victims in that clip. She talked about her, frustra her moment of frustration, her moment of frustration was she didn't get to th break the story. That's what she gave a shit about. And, and she's she, she's egoic centric individual. Now, does that mean she's a horrific person? I don't know, I don't know her personally. All I'm saying is that's a judgment of character on display for you right then and there. And these people are hiding it from you and they're putting young children out in front of you, hypersexualized. Look at it this way, folks. I just want to give it straight up. This is what they do. Me Too, Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell, three years. Three years. And what do they do last year? When 15,000 movies are made every single year, Hollywood is shelving films for 2021 and 2022 because of, of COVID. What do they do? They bring you cuties. A story of a group of 11-year-old girls on the cusp of womanhood in a hypersexualized movie. Now, 
the debate was, and I know all the arguments, but I'm going to just tell you one thing that most people don't know that the media never told anybody. That cinematographer and that director, so the cinematographer is the cameraman, the guy who's got the camera, the really badass camera and the lenses, and he's doing all the movements and all that. Okay. And that director, that woman of color that they identified her as, because it was this was a bold and feminist movie that had nothing to do with what everybody saw it was to do with. Those two people who made that film with a producer selected those scenes, wrote them, and did storyboards. And that cinematographer, that person in the DP, whose job is to know camera angles, lighting, aperture, lenses, because these lenses, when they use them, they have certain psychological effects on where you pull subjects forward or where you focus on it. Anyway, those shots, all of the shots in that film for five dance numbers that lasted three to five minutes each, where they were, tw I mean, you've seen the clips. They use the same camera angles that you find in movies like Showgirls, Dancing at the Blue Iguana, and any of the other uh, glorified imagery that is used in Hollywood movies to depict strippers or uh, downtrodden prostitutes who, you know, I, this is not a judgment against them. I'm saying the portrayal of this shit has got to end. And um, what they did while you all bought the argument, you know, not that you said, well, maybe, no. What they did was they put it out there to create the energy to summon that energy out. That's why they made the poster controversial. These people choose this crap carefully and they market research it. There are people with hundreds of thousands of dollars in salaries on the line here. So I just tell people, I like, look at this. I go, look, you have to understand this is how these people feel. Three years after Me Too, and this is what they, they show you. They show you WAP, and they call it empowerment and bold and feminine. And what it is, is it's 100% satanic because it's anti-human, anti-child, and anti-God. Not the, their God, it's a whole other issue. But the one, the, the father of all life, no, it's anti-him. And why this means so much right now is because they are stirring this up to use it. They're going to bring their satanic world into, they're going to try to, and this is not just through DC. This has nothing to do with, this is all the imagery of illusion. But they have been sowing this into the minds of our youth through music videos. Over the last 10 years, it's accelerated at a level that you just don't know. Children today are watching pornography as early as three years old. By eight, I... I got a letter from a woman yesterday. I'm not going to share the details of what she told me, but her son at eight years old is watching porn with another friend. And she says, my boy, she's in tears. My boy, that innocence and that spirit in him is gone. This shit, when you open it up in your mind, it fucks you up forever. When you do it to a child... Just just consider, guys. All I'm saying is think and watch yourself. Don't assume you know what is best according to all that has transpired before you. Because collectively, all of us have come here at this moment to witness all of this. And I'm not saying as a justification. You are going to witness this manifestation of this horror to the level and degree into which we say that is enough we must move in a new direction. You must plant as many seeds as you can everywhere. Not about the terrors and the horrors, but about the things you love about this world. See, you can create when you find meaning in life for something that speaks to you. Not the problems of the world out there. It's what speaks to you. I went into this 
thing of film because I had a traumatic childhood for which I was mostly unconscious of, but I explored it step at a time through my movies, moving through each movie. A child's when, voice, by the way, was really incredible. I uh, ended up watching it last week, and it was um, it's just a very powerful story. You know, these these um, two people that came together and had to um, because of this child's voice, and they end up you know uncovering this human trafficking ring. And it's definitely a very powerful story. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing your other films as well yeah well it's it's what you what a lot of people were apprehensive about it is because they didn't want to be freaked out and the truth of the matter is we handled it pretty deftly we didn't we didn't do anything exploitive there's some scary you know images and stuff but the real story there is the two the two people that come together the outsiders tim the homeless heroin addicted kid and christy who's the girl living with that abusive boyfriend who started selling children and she's seeking her mother who went missing years ago and mm -hmm. that child brings the two of them together tim ends up going on a mission to rescue her and it's an interpersonal drama between the relationship of the two of them when you have this honest expression and then there was love and then it summoned the courage for both of them to risk their lives to go try to find that child to protect that child and it comes full circle at the end of course but the real thing about it, anybody who sees it it's on vimeo on demand and i think the links are available um on the video uh not vimeo.com but vimeo on demand or you can go to my website no restrictions ent.com and uh, rent it or uh, purchase it um, but it was really about the road to redemption through love and that the child's voice is the one that's inside of each and every one of us asking, can you hear me? And when will we answer? And how will we answer? And the answer must be, I will help you. So to me, the whole journey of the last four years, I mean, it brought me back to dealing with my own child abuse and brought me back to my father before he died um i can say with certainty i know the forces at play in the world because i've been in my own hell and uh, i've examined it quite well i'm still working through some of that trauma that unconscious trauma um, but becoming more conscious of it. But I had a, a spiritual transformation in the last two years that I can't really put into words or an experience that would describe it wholly. Um, but it showed me that I was, uh, I was on the right path and I could see the truth in everything. And I didn't have to be a part of the lies anymore. I, the lies that I told myself too. And still, I mean, there's still ones in there. I, I have to face those. I mean, it's like, ah, I don't want to look at that, but yeah, that's there. But it's but it's about facing it. In, but here's the thing. It's having unconditional love is, is what is needed to face these things. That's really what it comes down to. Whether you're facing yourself within or facing the outside world, you must be a warrior. You, you know, whatever your warrior calling is, if it's warrior for children, let it be a warrior for children. But don't, don't go looking for the answer out there. The answer is in you. You have to ask the question that needs to be answered. Can you hear me? Can you hear it in you? This being here is the part that's the problem in the whole thing because we've given our authority into it. We've allowed it to tell us how to feel, how to think, told us what we can and can't do with our lives, what we must do or not do with our health, what we must do or not do with the, our speech. You see? So this authority that we have delegated away, the bill is coming due, and we have to answer with saying, hey, we're not paying for this shit. If we're going to pay for it, we're not going to pay for it on your time. We're going to pay for it on my time. And my time is going to be manifesting the new reality that I want to live in to the best of my being. With all of my ignorance, I will seek out the truth in every which way I can, and I will work with people 
who feel the same way that are are wanting to create they're not wanting they're not needing you to do anything for them they're not waiting for john or apollo to fix or come up with the solution to give to everybody and go here here's what it is oh great okay oh cool i got a starter pack you know you've got to be your own starter pack you've got to you've got to get the pieces of the limitations of the things that you have around you if you can't be around people who are like-minded go online and be around people who are like-minded but be productive and constructive talk about ideas talk about the things that you love Talk about yourself in ways that you've never expressed yourself before. Begin to train yourself in this way. This right here is the most powerful weapon that you have in the world. Because the moment that you speak truth through, in an, let me just put it very clear. In a world full of lies, the truth is like magic. The truth is what liberates everyone. The truth in your authenticity and your passion more than anything else is what excites and gathers people together. You don't have to be a great speaker. You don't have to be a leader. But like I said earlier, you're somebody to someone else in your own world. There is somebody out there who would be a child or a friend or a relative. You mean something to somebody. You can be somebody to somebody else. And that is greater than not. Because that person who is toiling in the dark, seeking the light, is going to have to seek longer. If you have the answer, if you've lived through hardship in your life and you've overcome it, teach people how to fish and nourish themselves. If they don't want to do it, that's a whole other issue. But it should not determine whether or not you choose to do that according to what other people do, then that's a falsehood. It's a lie. It's the same bullshit, just another way of like tricking yourself to go, well, you know, nobody wants to listen to me anyway. I don't have anything to say. If anything tonight, after this interview, I want anybody who, who has doubts uh, or, or wants and you want to be encouraged in a way, go to my link tree tonight and no restrictions, link tree forward slash no restrictions and go to I think it's a video, What Can I Do? And just sit back and watch John Rappaport from 2014. That was the first speech I watched in 2017 that really planted seeds in my being. Three years later, I am, I am not 100% uh, realized or actualized, but I am 70% better than I used to be. And it just got me thinking about what can I do? What can I do? And he... He goes through all of the arguments that all of us do at different levels of consciousness. But he's not like diminishing. He's just like saying, I'm trying to sell you, you. That's all this is. Otherwise, you delegate that authority to let these freaks over here sell you theirs. He's like, come on in. You can be whatever you want. This is the transhumanist agenda, folks. The transhumanist agenda, ultimately in concept, what it means is, is that I'm going to take you as far away from being in touch with your humanity, which is in trend, not the world, yourself, your heart, your mind, your connection to spirit. They want to turn all that off. And here's how they're doing it right now. First phase right now, genderless babies, gender fluid, he, she, they, them, all that. That's just sowing the concept. The other concepts have been going on digitized through Snapchat and others where they do avatars. So again, these are innocent things when thinking about them on that scale, but these are seeds that they are planting to create entire generations of people who will evolve with the program. So what that means is, is that it's kind of like this right here, right? This is a phone, just gonna hold it up, okay? Now, this came out, what, 13 years ago, 13, 14 years ago, right? And so here's what the transhumanist agenda in a, in a way is, okay, conceptually. Apple comes out with a phone for you to call people, text them, do email, and some other things, web browsing, right? But 13 iterations later, we now have thumbnails or fingerprint scans facial recognition scans. We have GPS tracking, 
we have all of your data. We have all of your contacts. We've got data points. We've got profiles on you. We've got all your social media. We've got all, we've got algorithms running against every single thing that you've ever looked at and touched. And we've cataloged all of it and stored it away in these servers in Utah. So we have years and years and years of data on you. Now, if they came out and told you that from day one, would you have bought it? No. But now 96% of Americans have one of these things or a cell phone, flip phone, otherwise. And it's now reading your biometric health data and sending it off somewhere in the cloud. And it's following how many steps you've walked and what your breathing rate is like. And they're gonna deploy other apps that are gonna do that as well. They're going to get more feedback on each person. This is a portable tracking device. And you know, you know how you know how fucked up life is? Leave this at home and go out without it and see how much you are like going freaking out that you can't go anywhere without it. That's how they got you right here in the mind, guys. This is mind war. And this is how it works. And it doesn't mean you have to be anti-technology, but dependency is where they're moving everyone's mind into technology. Because here's the thing, here's how it's gonna be sold to you all in the general way. All of this chaos, destruction that you are witnessing unfold socially, economically, spiritually, whatever you want to, however you quantify it, is going to be used to make the argument that humanity can't self course correct. So we need more authoritarian, draconian, and innovative measures. That's how it'll be presented innovative measures to police, innovative measures to surveil, innovative measures to curb what? All in the name of curbing crime that these people helped create. So they create the condition which we allow them to do and our unconsciousness manifests in crime and violence and everything else. So they have pre-populated the population with all of these bullshit ideas so that when Black Lives Matter comes along, it gathers up enough steam in an election year because of the hatred of Donald Trump, who's the perfect boogeyman to scare the holy shit out of an entire population of people and the world so that they can enact their agendas and make righteousness popular through violence. And here's the thing, whether you are for or against Black Lives Matter, that's not the issue. The net effect of that whole movement was $2 billion in property damage last year for justice. And not to mention all for the donations justice. went straight to the Biden campaign and not to help. Yes, yeah, so so it's it's, it's it's a horrible thing to witness because you're seeing through, you. Donald Trump blew a hole through reality and for anybody who dared to look through that, they saw a whole other world. Some of us have come along over years, some of us long before Trump came, some of us in the last few months. It doesn't matter, you're here now. Embrace it because what he is or was doesn't really matter because the reality is, is that you are living in a time where there is a war on your mind and you have to get this and this and this together because it's going, the world that they will offer you will always pull at you emotionally, whether it be by fear or other means of deception. Fear has been a very useful tool for the last 20 years for them from 9-11 to now. There's nobody that you could sit down and say who lived in 1990, would you rather be living now or in 1990 or in the 1990s with Hootie and the Blowfish? <laughs> I'll take it. Now, I mean, I know it's got its pluses and minuses, but what I'm saying is that you don't have the, um, you don't have a choice. Um, we allowed this to happen to ourselves. We did not wake up enough at 9-11. We didn't wake up at 20, 2008 with Wall Street. And here's what, here's what you all need to know. This is how this whole thing works. Part of it is there's been a rise in consciousness. Now, I don't want to get too much into the esoteric dark arts stuff where they've pre-planned and cosmic timelines. I, I am not well-versed in those things, but I know generally what I'm talking about when I speak of those. But here's what it means on a practical scale. 
if you go back in time and you look at everything from 1992 to now, 1992, you had Bill Clinton, George H.W. Bush, and Ross Perot right in the middle two, between two CIA monsters. And if you watch, if you go back and watch any of those debates from 92, you'll cry your eyes out because that man was a prophet compared to where we are now. And the compassion and love that he had for children, as he expressed, he even said back then that we now know that children as young as 18 months old have a positive or negative view of themselves. And we need to do everything we can to create those kind of conditions that every child grows up in a nurturing home. This is a politician in 1992, that crazy, hey, here's the deal. You know, but that was a caricature of him. He won those debates. I went back and I watched Peter Jennings, I think, or, or Sam Donaldson did a, um, I think it was Sam Donaldson did a uh, focus group. I mean, a cross section of America, men, women, young, old, different races, everything. Nine out of 10, I think, or 11 out of 12 all said Perot won. Now, why is this important? Because 1996, they cut him out. 2000, we had uh, a rigged, I mean, it was a fraudulent election. There were rigged elections long before, don't worry. Believe me, 1992, you know how they called the 1992 presidential race? People should go back and watch that on YouTube. They go to state by state, Bill Clinton declared the winner in New Mexico. There's no percentages. There's no tallies coming in. There's no statistics. They just declared it and everybody bought it. <laughs> they had to become more sophisticated. They had to find new ways to get you interested in the game, to keep the illusion going, because if there's numbers and there's facts, you see? So we have a lot of work to do. Um, it's not an easy task, but what, what, what I want people to understand is they are trying to curtail consciousness rising at every step of the way. Ron Paul in 2008, I'm just using political as an event. There's other events too. But then you also had the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street, which were organic initially, and then they were co-opted. And then Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street, I remember Van Jones out there because I voted for Obama in the second term again. And, and he was talking about, oh, you know, he heard, the president has heard you. And we're going to take care of, of the, the big fat cats that he all promised, you know, in 2008 to take care of. And that they, it was a show, folks. It was a show. Smoke and mirrors. Then you got Trump, which was the ugly face, woke everybody up. That was, that was by design. All the attention flooded to him. He became the media. He reflected back to you what you wanted to see. If you wanted to see Hitler, you saw Hitler. If you wanted to see a patriot, you saw a patriot. If you wanted to see a funny guy, you saw a funny guy. If you want to see a racist, you saw a racist. That's actually the definition of a Hayoka impasse from what I've heard. Um, so I actually know of a Zuni Native American elder, uh, Clifford Mahoudi. He speaks a lot in the UFO kind of community. And he actually has um, confirmed this. He's like, yeah, he's definitely a Hayoka. I thought that was very interesting. You can definitely see it. It's like, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, you know, I wanted to make a point earlier when you were getting into um, these certain movements, like the Me Too movement and mm -hmm. all these things that are, you know, coming out of the entertainment industry. Um, it's interesting because it's like those things are glorified. Like, you know, what you're talking about in the middle of like the the pride protest, like the young kid twerking and everything. It's like those things are glorified. But then I was a part of the Save the Children protest in Hollywood and those were like it was insane to me how the media spun it it was like mm -hmm. you know they were like oh these are all i'm not going to say the letter because the youtube show but you right. know um 17th letter of the alphabet that's what this movement is and it's like wait so anyone who wants to rally for saving children is you know just going to be thrown in with that and then what about the children? It's like, okay. And then this is like this beautiful, amazing movement. Everyone there mm -hmm. was very amazing people. And it was, I, I did a few of them. Uh, we did like three before it kind of, we were worried about it getting taken over and everything. Mm -hmm. But it's like, it's so crazy to me that, that those kind of movements are like made into this horrible thing when then there's these other movements that are. Yep. I mean, it's just it's interesting um, the way the media is kind of spinning 
everything. Yeah, it's 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 quite astonishing when you consider that you know three years after Me Too, Jeffrey Epstein and Maxwell, it's a conspiracy theory uh, that there is an elite pedophile ring in Washington D.C. And then I so mean, it's, the, just, it's just it's jaw dropping that that is like oh wait. You mean Bill Clinton was involved with Jeffrey Epstein and spoke at the DNC. That should be an indicator to everybody how they think about every single one of you. They called everybody who had a problem with cuties a right-wing conspiracy theorist. Think about that. Think about Hollywood. Look, you want any evidence, just anything about Hollywood? Go to Deadline.com and look up the Hollywood Child Protection Act and why it's important. They say why it's being ignored. This law was enacted for people who were getting back into the industry under another name after they had been registered as a sexual offender of children. And everybody said, we have to have this. They passed it, they implemented it, and the attorney general was Kamala Harris during the time of that enforcement that did not occur. $10,000 fine for anybody who didn't register. And guess what? They weren't asking the aid, or they were not asking the director, the producer, the stars. They were asking the publicist and the still photographer and the manager and the casting director, for which the majority of them said they didn't even sign it and it wasn't enforced. So, what does it mean? What does it mean in an industry where James Gunn and all of his jokes about pedophilia, dozens of them, you go and read The Hollywood Reporter after he was fired off the Guardians of the Galaxy, and there are people who said, I'm lining right up to hire him on his next project. No questions asked. There, there are major about, people high up in Disney that are, um, I believe, like the CEO of Disney and um, you know different people that are high up yeah. in the entertainment division of Disney. They are all convicted pedophiles, and they're still working with children to this day. Yeah. I mean, they, they use they use these, you know, the movements, what you're talking about, like, let's talk about them. Let's go back to your point, because, I mean, we can get off on like a lot of things, but the, the topics are around movements. And so this is what I said in my video last year. But I, I mean, I, I know that it's it's new, so I'm not like expecting people to know everybody to know it. But I said, um, this is a movement that they're not going to give you. And, and it's evidenced by the fact that forget cuties, forget all this other stuff. This is an issue that I'm just standing back and going two things. Number one, when does Hollywood not take the opportunity to give you its opinion on what you should be doing and thinking and where you put your time and attention on causes and issues? They give you racism. They don't say a goddamn thing about so child sex trafficking or pedophilia for which think, there are thousands of young performers in their industry, many of whom have been sexually abused. I have another point to add to that. Um, yeah. The Me Too movement. I have never understood why. I feel like they purposely created this slogan yeah, to make... Um, I don't know if you've seen this yet, but have you noticed? It's like the hashtag Me Too movement. But then the original way of saying that sign this sign was the pound sign so basically all these people that are coming out and saying their stories they're saying their story and then they're like pound me too the other it's a little the, joke the, but it's not, it's no, not funny, I, 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 funny. Let me, let me, <laughs> no but let me explain for the people that may say okay that's a little bit of a stretch okay i want to no no i want to dovetail that because i, I do believe I know who these people are. <laughs> they don't play around with occult things. They do them. They do them in everything because there's energy in them. That's what they put. The, this is Look, whether you believe this or not, I'm not saying this about you. Whether any of the people listening believe this or not, these people do believe this and they put energy into everything that they do. Everything has meaning in everything that they do. Everything. They don't leave shit to chance. They own this world. That's their that's their role in this time uh, for now. But to hold it, you know, what did they come up after Me Too? They came up with Time's Up. Now, 
What was Time's Up? Time's Up was a creation from CAA, Creative Artists Agency, which had Alyssa Milano, who's married to one of the partners over there. I was next to that building for two years. I've, I was in that area, which many people have seen on Google Maps or Google Earth, the construction site where the, the pyramids and then the pyramid and the eye of Ra and all of that. People talk about in Century City, the, the above where CAA is. <clears throat> That's all true. That's all true. Next to it is a, there's a coffee bean and then there's a little deli restaurant, but it's a winery. And it serves only Rothschild's wineries. Wait, where is this again? It's in it's in Century City. It's it's CAA who created Times Up and Me Too. They are right there in Century City, and people talk about that Google map shot that people put out, and I think in 2017. It's kind of hard to find nowadays because they've censored so much. But um, it's an overhead, it's a bird's eye view of the construction of the buildings. So how they're arranged. There's two pyramids pointing inward buildings. And then there's a pyramid that runs down in the lawn. And in the center of it is the Eye of Ra. And above it is the CAA. So it's, it's, a, it's a perfect pyramid. I mean, clear as day. You cannot, you cannot sit there and go, wait a minute. You're telling me that these, the people that designed this building did not see the, the, that the eye of Ra was there and that the pyramid was there just like the pyramid, you know, like the all seeing eye. You're, you're telling me that <laughs> it's there, it's there. It's not like some imagination, it's there, the shape of it, everything. But right next to that is a, a deli. So they have restaurants there because there are businesses in that park. That's a whole, like Century City is like a really rich area. Like if you go to the, the mall there, the mall is outdoor, but it's like, high high level quality everything wood and marble and i mean it's it's not tacky it's very very cool very very chic um but this is a high well-to-do area and so anyway the point being is that next door to that they had a deli restaurant with a winery in there and it was rothschild's wine estate it was rothschild 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 the Rothschild wine is, winery is right next to that, next to CAA. And I'm just like sitting there going, what are the chances? <laughs> but the thing about Time's Up, and that's the original point of why we brought all this up, was because Time's Up was basically, to me, uh, expiration. In the Los Angeles New Times, there was a girl. This is after all the disclosures of Me Too. There was a young actress who was working in a movie with uh, Kip Perdue, who was in Remember the Titans and been in many other films over the last 20 years. And supposedly the allegation was that he had reached over and had her touch his penis when they were doing a sex scene before in rehearsal. And then he, he said some pretty shitty things to her as well. And she was totally traumatized by the event. This is after Me Too, okay? So, so Time's Up has already been set up, all that other stuff. And in the, the LA Times, she had to go six months, six months telling her story over and over and over to this person, to that person, to this person, not even to file a complaint, to get some action on any of this shit. She even went to one of the people I know to get some help. So this is all bullshit, period, end of story. The, the, the people in Hollywood that tell you things are changing, listen, until I see, here's, here's, what I, here's what I'll believe that Hollywood has changed. To anybody who's listening in the industry, it's the moment you all come out like a corporation would and say that there have been allegations into things that we know for a fact are conspiracy theories or not true allegations. And we are gonna launch a full investigation with full transparency, outside and auditors coming in, opening up the books, and we are going to get to the bottom to see if we really have a sex trafficking problem and a pedophilia problem in our industry. That's the first thing you would do. And you would do so, why? Because you've lost millions and millions and millions of dollars because of these allegations. 
So it's to your financial benefit to clean house and say to everybody, we're not, we're not like this. It was a dark chapter in our history. If it's true, if it's not true, we're not going to stop until every stone is unturned, overturned, and looked at and examined. Then you can have the full faith and confidence. No different than we're going to edit the election results and we're going to provide transparency so that people can believe in the democratic process that we are asking them to participate in every four years. So it's no different. But it's not me calling them out. They can't change. The people at the top can't change, but you can change. You can change. You can do something today that you haven't done before. You can walk away from these people and their money. You don't need them. If you have talent, you don't need somebody who does this to children and makes you pay a price to them so you can create your art and have your career in fame. There are so many of us out there that want reality, authenticity, and truth to come back into the world that has gone insane, that has gone mad. So it's a choice at this point to serve a system of power that preys upon the most innocent and vulnerable and defenseless. It doesn't matter that it's people here, there, or there. It doesn't matter if it's a few. It does not matter if it's one. If you know it, they should be out of there. They have no business serving our interests in anything that, is, that has to do with our lives because their judgment is a conscious of crisis for which they cannot reconcile. And because they cannot reconcile it, they'll allow SB 145 to go through in California, which enables a 24-year-old man to have sex with a 14-year-old boy. And be it, the judge will not rule him as a sex offender because it could be, quote, determined consensual. That's what you get in a state run by pedophiles. That's what you get when you have Gavin Newsom on Twitter two years ago with a banner of a crowd with people's hands and fists raised or fingers raised, and one of them is photoshopped in there with a pedo sign on it. That was on Twitter for months on Gavin Newsom's Twitter handle, his official account, not a parody account. No way. Yes. It people should go and look that up. Put, no way. Wow. Mm -hmm. I, I voted to recall him, so I hope that's happening soon. But yes, but I but I want I want to encourage you know I I don't know what time I, I know we got to be con conscious it's of time. It's been about so. two hours here. Oh my god! <laughs> I would like to wrap this up with yes. um, healing childhood traumas, like what are the solutions? Yeah. Yes. So um, this is the key, guys. The psychological the 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 psych psychiatric community is evolving but it is not evenly evolving and what that means is, is that there's a whole bunch of therapies out there that you need to dial into and get get uh something that you have access to today that doesn't cost you any money it's just your existing costs or the internet go on youtube you need to look up of havening by paul mckenna there's also other techniques out there i looked it up the other day after you showed me um it's very interesting yeah, and you're talking about like for people who have high levels of stress, anxiety, or any kind of fears, what you're doing it's an exercise of five to ten minutes, and he got you got to listen to him. But he guides you, and and you, what you're doing by doing this exercise, you're manifesting and creating delta brain waves, which are taking you out of your your high anxiety thought mind and lowering your 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 mind into a, a less stress, less thought, less worry, less fearful. Um, state by, I would say, if you do it 10 to 15 minutes, you're talking at least a 50% reduction minimum. And you can do it again and over and over and over, and it will do, it will lower it even more with each time. And you can do it as many times as you want. It doesn't hurt you. Um, it's free. That technique is out there. The other ones um, you can do yourself and you can learn this is EFT, matrix re-imprinting. EFT is emotion freedom thought technique. It was developed by Carl Dawson in the 19, late 1970s and another partner. Um, it has been uh, replicated over different 
I mean, there are, there are uh, psychiatrists today that practice this. So what it is is, um, and this kind of goes into a little bit about the child abuse part, which is a person typically who studies emotion freedom technique and is a, a, a practitioner of it, a licensed practitioner, it could be a therapist, doesn't have to be a clinical psychologist. Um, what they typically do is they practice what's called compassionate parenting which is acknowledgement of the emotion and being there almost like a parent with the child with no judgment, no attachment, and no resistance to the child. So what it does is it creates a safe place for you to be able to express yourself um, for the first time in a way that you have not been able to articulate with someone who is not judging you. It's a strain. Of course, therapists, that's true, but EFT uses... Uh, a psychohypnotic technique, and I, maybe that's not the right word for it, but what it does is it takes the emotion of the past, that trauma, with that thought, and it breaks the bond of it immediately. It takes the emotion away from the thought, so the memory is no longer a traumatic memory, it's just a memory. And it could be something in your present life or your past, but, but all of these things, they're in other words, the way our body and our minds work, we don't we don't take an information up here and 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 uh, logically process it. We have to emotionally agree with it too. And so those traumas that are so strong in us. We have a, we have a switch. But the motion freedom technique and matrix reimprinting tapping is something which is EFT. You can go online, go on YouTube, and look it up. There's many demonstrations out. There's many techniques that'll help you as well, especially over the long term meditation and prayer uh can't stress that enough breathing technique wim hof has got a perfect 30 breath technique that is guaranteed to get you into a uh, a more focused and alive mind um there are sound baths people want you know like more spiritual sound baths to me are kind of like a a, a massage symphony for your body and brain um, where people go and they play, you know, you've seen those um, quartz crystal bowls. Uh, there's, there's actually today you can probably go on YouTube and find a whole channels now dedicated. You know, I mean, there's Tibetan bowls. These things, um, I personally believe you should attend them, especially if uh, if the place like in, out. Actually, Apollo, all the people in um, California where you are should seek out Nassim. Uh, Nassim, I'll, I'll put her contact information to you so you can get it out to everybody. She is in the Orange County, so they're not doing the, the crap, you know, the lockdown crap. She's doing all of these spiritual retreats. She's doing them both online and in person in Orange County. She she was a guest on my podcast, No Restrictions. She was episode six. Um, she's just fantastic. She's, a, she's an incredible spiritual person. Sound baths are really powerful. They can open up a lot of uh, channels in you. And I mean that channel. I don't mean like, uh, you know, occult stuff. I'm talking about the energy, frequency, and vibration in resonance can heal a lot of the traumas that are blocking us. And so a lot of times, like I've gone to a couple of them where, you know, you'll see colors and shapes. You might even have visions. Um, it's very, it's very, it's not intense. It can be, but it's, it's, if it's done well, it kind of brings you on a ride and then lets you land somewhere. I love gently. when they use didgeridoos at night. Um, What's that? Those are my favorite didgeridoos. Mm -hmm. You know, the Australian instruments. Yeah, yeah. That, oh my gosh. Yeah, the different uh, actually, instruments. Disclosure Fest here in LA, uh, I work with this um, group called Disclosure Fest. And usually at all their events, they have them. Um, I, they're probably doing more coming up here. I think the Disclosure Fest, where they're going to have a lot of speakers on, is going to be coming up a little later this year. So definitely no. recommend checking them out. But yeah, the um, didgeridoos with that is my favorite. And they actually, yeah. um, I actually had an Australian, um, it was an indigenous, indigenous trained didgeridooist <laughs> from Australia. He um, could actually bring you through a session of like healing childhood traumas with uh with the didgeridoo with these different wow it was like a special kind of shamanic yeah. ritual session and i really i love those yeah sorry go on <laughs> oh no no this is i this is a conversation i mean i know i talk a lot but i i love hearing your insight too because that's what makes it valuable for the for the audience and and me too because i i didn't know that that you could heal with those 
you know, he could heal you with a, an instrument. But it, but it speaks to that thing about what Tesla was talking about, that if you wish to understand the secrets of the universe, you must think in terms of the energy, frequency, and vibration of things. Because it's matter and it's waves and it, it, it waves intersect and they, they can change direction. And that's like our thoughts, that's like our bodies. You know, if a force that is stronger comes in, not necessarily a bad force, but a force that is stronger, it can change trajectories within us. Events, you know, events, I mean, we were experiencing through consciousness and our bodies and, and, and oh, this happened, this happened, these are the people involved. But ultimately, the whole thing was an energy. It was an energy event. And those energies were a multiple dimensions of thought and physical and, you know, so, and, and, and then there's time, you know, with thought and, a, I mean, the, the magnificence of your body, it should not be underestimated. You guys, we're a temple. Your body is a temple. You should treat it as such. It really, truly is. No matter what ignorant level of understanding you come from, it is a temple. So, it's sacred. In the face of all of what we've just said, is it not possible that you are something more than what you've been told? Are you not a child of a creator, of a living being, of, of a being that has life on this planet with nature, for which, here's the other thing, the healing part. You need to get your ass out in nature as much as possible. Now that doesn't mean you have to go hiking and camping ground your feet your bare feet on the earth every day for 20 minutes a day minimum and you will see changes in your health you will see for changes me, in your mood um, hiking with the sh my shaman spirits is actually my favorite thing ever to do because i actually have a uh, copper coils crystals magnets and uh is it actually like naturally magnetic hematite sand on the inside so it actually kind of like almost um connects with your consciousness so i actually like always go hiking with them and yeah it's a really meditative experience i enjoy it a lot <laughs> well i've seen some of your videos i'm like going well i love your artistic style and your cosmic ways because i'm like going i have no idea but it's like it's fascinating to me because because it's i mean i go out with a hiking stick right but and i'm i'm more of the traditional boy scout when it comes to that kind of thing but I just, the, the thing that I've learned in this time is really the most resistance I ever have is to things that I am lacking in myself. So when I don't like somebody, because that energy reminds me of what I lack or how I really feel on the inside. And these are things that like, once you have these realizations, it's just a turn it's really just like a turn, like a simple turn. You start to see things in a more gentle, precious, and fragile way. Part of the healing, when you get into all of this, I don't want to use air quotes, but in spirituality, it's not just spirituality like I'm teaching you spirituality. Spirituality is an, is, is an experience for which there are not words to describe for where you cannot give that experience to anyone. They must discover it for themselves, which is not a less than position. It's simply this. Each and every single one of us is magnificent and precious. But when you go out into the world and you look at this person and that person, you go, that person's precious? That person's a child of God? They're not living like it. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's a select group, but I'm just saying for the love of God, would you not think of yourself as something important in the world? Just yourself. And then maybe start seeing other people the same way. And the reason why I tell people to go to Jesus is not because I'm some Bible-thumping individual. I'm telling you the love, the love and the life of that man, whether you believe he's the son of God or a mystic or a spiritual, uh, one of the great spirits or a prophet or whatever, doesn't matter. I mean, it does. But in the final analysis, doesn't matter in terms of your lived experience what you believe. But I'm telling you this, that if there is a structure of a way, a truth, and a life to follow, it's there. 
in this insane world, it's there. If you start there and want to go to other places, that's your right. I started with meditation, sound baths, Buddhism, and I came all the way full circle to Jesus after being told by some of the highest people who had been up at the very top saying, no, if you say Jesus or Yahshua, they'll hear you. That name has value and energy. So, you know, for those who are skeptical, keep it in your back pocket, evoke Christ when you need him, if that's the way it takes, you know, sometimes we have to hit rock bottom. Sometimes you do. I had to hit rock bottom. I had to hit a, a road. A, a, I had to, this guy you're watching was charming, fun, charismatic, all of those things, and I was alone at 38. I was, I was alone. I had no friends, no real friends, because I didn't love myself. That's really what it was. I went around for years in my 20s blaming everything, Hollywood and the women are crazy. No, I picked them all. Part of, part of the healing is the truth. You must begin to face the truth about yourself is as best you can with care. You want to learn how to master the world, learn how to master your own dark side with unconditional love, and you'll be a rock star because you don't have the problems that so many unconscious people do, which is they pick and choose their likes and their dislikes, what they hate and what they love. And it's false. If you love, what in other ways, in another way is this. Jesus told you, love your enemies. Be good to those who hate you and who hurt you, as I have loved you. Now, a lot of people go, what the hell are you talking about? If you go down the road of having enemies, your hatred will be your guide. The one, the hatred that you're in denial of will be your guide leading you down the path of the dark side with your best intentions. Having to have enemies in your life is a choice. That means being around them, surrounding yourself with them, going through them, working with them, attacking them, fighting them, gives energy to the whole damn thing, makes it real. Totally does, you play a role. As I said earlier, they live rent-free in your head so you, I feel like a lot of the time you're attracting those people because those are actually qualities you have. I, I noticed that exactly a lot right. with myself. Like once I start analyzing it, it's like every single person, I'm like, you know what? I just really don't like this thing about this person. And then I started looking at it, I'm like, oh, it's something that I do a lot. <laughs> and like, it's like once you really start looking at that, um, it's like all these people that become attracted to you are these mm -hmm. really just these reflections of yourself. It's so interesting. It's yeah. like the universe just really like interacts with you. And to me, like God and the universe are very synonymous things. So it's like what you were saying earlier with everything. It's like, you know, we really do. We have to look at every single person with unconditional love. Because to me, I mean, personally, to me, I feel like we're all one in every person even though they might seem like an external person they're all a part of this one collective consciousness so That's you know correct. it's yeah and there's and there's evidence of that too for people who doubt that we're all connected um there is a man i wish i had the book here i'd hold it up but it was from 1979 there was a man who was a brilliant man he died years ago and he wrote a book on the civiliz the evolution of civilization essentially that showed that over thousands of years civilization evolved independently globally right okay so we didn't have the connected world we did today that's obvious but back then you couldn't necessarily send information across the world it could take years and you'd have to know where you're going and you'd have to know that there were people there in undiscovered lands. So here's what he found. He found that with every major change in the world that occurred, now think about this, this is crazy, thousands of years ago, 
civilization collectively within a five to 15 year period, places that had no connection or knowledge of each other on other sides of the world began to express the same consciousness in art, music, literature, inventions, technology, science, religion, doctrines, laws. Now, why would that be? Why would that be? You go into <clears throat> the Pacific in the 1950s. They had dropped atomic bombs all over the islands there. And they sent ships out after to see if any life was still there years after, if it was still habitable. And they found a group of monkeys there that were washing these coconuts with water to wash the sand off. And they saw that the younger monkeys were washing them and more and more joined in. Now, the oldest ones were the, the most resistant to doing this new way of cleaning the coconut before they eat it. But what happened was, is that once the 100th monkey began doing the washing, all the other monkeys simultaneously began washing the monkey. The ones that had resisted, the ones that hadn't done it before, the ones that didn't even see it, just began to organically behave and act in the same manner. And not and just on that island. That's that right. They went to the neighboring islands and saw that the same thing was happening. The same phenomena had carried to other islands for which they were not connected to. There is something going on in the world that we don't see. This I is noticed where that with inventions and, um, you know, a lot of times like song, even like music and stuff. It's like it, it seems like a lot of people, like certain people will kind of see this vision at the same time. And it's like mm -hmm. whoever acts on it first. Um, I, I think that's very interesting. Yes. It, it, it's like it happens very often. It's like, you know, it's like if you can tune into it or if you're the one that just kind of go with it, mm -hmm. then you'll be the first one to like let it out. But it yeah. really seems like it's, you know, and people, I, I said this on the past interview, but um, the ancient way of thinking was the ancient people. They didn't think of it as people thinking, but as thoughts peopling. And I always like to look at it that way. I think that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's a consciousness that is man that expresses itself through each instrument in the entire symphony of it all. And that's you. You're an instrument in the symphony and you have to learn how to master and play your instrument to the best of your abilities as you go forward because it's valuable. I mean, what's amazing about this time if we, if we make it in the way that I think we can, but you know, who knows? The thing is, is that what we have to remember is that what our future is, it starts right here, right now. So it's not about five years from now or six months from now. In other words, your heart is manifesting and creating your reality according to how you feel and perceive reality simultaneously. And so by the time you get to that next future state, it's not going to be the future anymore and it's gonna be the present, which you are already in to begin with at every time. So these choices are moment to moment, they're thought to thought, and all the spaces in between. And once you command that power, and the more self-awareness you have, the more you watch yourself, not that you know yourself up here in your head, the more you watch yourself, the more layers of discernment you have to be able to know what is right and wrong, what is true and not true. Because the person inside is the one who is the key to unlocking the whole world. That's really what it comes down to for yourself. No one else can come in and unlock and show you that world that's inside of you. You are the only one that can see what's going on up here and in here. So you're the one who has to create that manifestation. Now, it may take a partner or somebody else, but you have to do the work. The work is, should be fun. The work should be play. There was a, I, I wanna mention this one thing. There was a woman I met years ago in LA who had gone to school for four years, went out there for advertising and said, I hate it, I'm getting out, I'm going back to school. And she was gonna go to culinary arts school. And I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm baking wedding cakes. 
I want to bake wedding cakes. How do you go from marketing to wanting to bake a wedding cake and why? Like, why would you, at that time, I was like, why would you leave LA? Why? There's so much money. In the, but I also understood the, the people there at that time. And what was interesting is she said, and I, and I say this is a piece of advice for everyone, is that I said, what got you into wanting to do that? She said, well, I started thinking back to all of my memories, which ones were the most fun for me. And the one I remembered was my mother and I in the kitchen baking together. And so that's how she chose her career. So, and, and I'm just saying it's, it's all is within you folks. It really truly is in the age and era of this level of information and it is available to you. Understand that you must seize the moment now while you have it. You cannot wait for it to unpack at a future date because the world needs you right now and is, and is insignificant of a way that you think you are. I was a guy on a live stream last August talking about the censorship of my movie and something moved me to speak further and sent it to two of my friends and that thing went worldwide to over 100 million people. And I got thousands of, of letters from all over and to this day I still do, ones that I mean, I was in tears thank you thank you thank you for saying all that you did i work with victims of abuse you get exactly what i'm talking about but that was because it was my lived experience in the full that's what i'm saying guys you have to line that thing up jordan peterson talks about it perfectly and articulates it but what i'm saying at the core essence the emotion is love love overcomes fear only people that want to stay in that fear are ones that want to be in fear and are married to that fear. And hopefully one day they will decide to break that courtship. But love is what brings light into the world of dark. It makes all the darkness move into the shadows and everything else that is seeking the light will come forward. The key is that you must bring forward the world that you want to see so that when that refugee wakes up, that person you supposedly care about, and even if you don't, the person that sees you as the enemy who will later be the victim of their system, it needs you more than ever before to create the world that will be there for them when the old one falls. When the old one fails and betrays them, you must have a play. Otherwise, all this is going to be, all this will be, is another exercise in another four-year election for which all of us, come outside here on the outside and go, look, look at how horrible and shitty it is, look. And you'll get all these people that'll say, yes, that's right. Okay, what do we do? Look, look at how horrible it is. That's what you're gonna get. And you know, those people serve a purpose, but you need builders too. You need people who point out that there's a, there's a, there's a ass fuckery afoot and whistleblowers, those are good, but now you have a shift in consciousness, you have to go, okay, I know how dark it can get, let's take that into consideration for anything we build from here on out. Let's not argue about who's right and who's wrong, it's going, what are your ideas? You know, kind of ironically, I actually have been touring with a presentation called Solutions for Humanity that was really along these lines. It was like, I just kind of laid out all the solutions of how we could manifest a better future collectively, because I felt like um, with the way the media is and everything, it's like they only talk about what the problems are, but it's like, we never talk about the solutions. Right. And um, so I really felt like it'd be cool to like lay everything out. And I kind of talked to, about different ways of doing communities and the importance of full disclosure and yep. just a lot of different concepts that a lot of people actually don't really know about that. I, I didn't realize so many people didn't know about some of these concepts in it. And uh, I was kind of going around giving that and it was actually the three years leading up to all of this that went down this year. And really like when I thought about it, I'm like, wow, this would be a great blueprint of how we could rebuild if, you know, things do get a little worse. Um, so I'm actually planning on doing a series out of my presentation called Solutions for Humanity. I'm not sure if it'll be on this channel or I might mm -hmm. put it somewhere else, but mm -hmm. that's in the works as soon as I get in my studio next week. So 
I'm yeah. excited for that. No, that, these are the things that like I, I've talked to many people there. There's a website out there called freedomcell.org. People should go look that up. That's an online digital community of builders of different, like they have all different interests. And they, I, I think right now they have over 60,000 members. And so what they're doing is they're creating online sort of like um, communities of around certain topics that are all centered on heart centered and solutions. So you can find cryptocurrency in there. There's a crypto group in there. There's uh, there's people that are dealing with spirituality. There's ones dealing with food resources. There are people dealing with farming and growing your own food. It's called, look at what it is. It's called self-reliance, self-sufficiency. Instead of, instead of um, in other words, if you really want to, you want to, you want to see an exact statistic that that proves everything what i'm talking about i mean at least it's a symptom of it african americans in uh the great around the great depression first one uh in the 20s and 30s they had a higher per capita than they do today uh in relation to inflation even with all of the racism the oppression the the jim crow laws everything they had higher rate uh, per capita they had two-thirds of their family together and here's, here's why that happened, because they had trade skills. Now, this is not a, an argument for or against, well, I'm going to always be against slavery, but what came out of that was blacksmith, leatherworking, farming, and other things with their hands, labor, skilled labor with their hands. We don't have that anymore. We have a education system that plugs you into a digital, I mean, computer all day. And so what that does is it, 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 it programs your creativity out of you because you become a, a function of the computer. You, you're just basically going in and typing on it and working on it day, day after day after day and the dependency and all the work. And, and, it's, and it's, just go, it's just ones and zeros at the end of the day. I'm not diminishing anybody's creation, but what I'm saying is manifestation of creation tr takes things from your mind, your heart, and into your hands and building it. Yes, you can build it on a screen, no doubt. But if you, if you want to have that connection with the world and other people, you must create something. Art, even if it's a hobby, doesn't matter. It needs to be your play. You need to find your child. You need to find your five-year-old child inside of you again and reconnect with them. That is the number one thing for trauma that I can tell you as an adult, you have the power to love your child in the way that they were not loved. You have the ability to reconnect with your child and give them the unconditional love that they absolutely positively deserve that they were denied as a child. So this is where it comes in, where you become the compassionate, loving, un the forgiving and empathetic individual for yourself first. And then you can then have compassion, empathy, unconditional love, and forgiveness for others who go against you, who are unconscious in their behavior. Because you see, see, when you have compassion for yourself, you realize that I have unconscious behavior, she has unconscious behavior, he has unconscious behavior, and we're unconsciously attacking or debating or working together. Whatever it is that is creating this sort of chaotic dynamic right so when you're the adult with your own child you can be the adult to all children and it's not an authoritative position it's one of openness and passivity so that what you do with compassionate parenting what you can begin to do when you see yourself and others is you can gently hold up the mirror and acknowledge that this is me too this is my suffering, is your suffering, and your suffering is my suffering. And when we have that universal understanding that, yes, we got here in different ways, but we share these same emotions, and they're real to us, and we acknowledge that, we have a new, we have a new paradigm that begins to form in someone because they've been acknowledged for the pain and suffering that they've never been able to um, resolve and now they have a connecting point of someone who's saying i know what it's like to be that way because i have been that way myself and i've struggled with it for years and it hurts 
No one has done that to somebody in a long, long time who is suffering for which they are dwelling and toiling in it. There's no one there for them. There has been no one there for them before. And some of it they have done to themselves. Don't get me wrong. This is not like innocence, like black and white. You have to make your choices. But what I'm saying is the, the, this all starts in here. You waiting on them to change or this person to change or this person to do it for you, you're, you're just, you're lost, man. In this time, waiting on everybody else to change for you, that's a narcissist. That's perfect for people who want to look at the world as their enemy and be righteous in their position in opposition to it. Good luck with that. Good luck with that bringing you all the joy and success and the love that you want to have when you see everyone who is not on your wavelength an enemy, who doesn't agree with you, who doesn't see it your way, who doesn't relate to you, because you've, you've kept going through the old arguments and they don't work anymore, and they're all of your own contradictions that you've been holding on to and holding up as your virtue or your identity. Saying, this is what I believe. And because I believe it, and you don't, and you don't see it the way I do, you're wrong. You're a pedophile enabler. I've seen that shit online. It's ridiculous. And, and really, it says more about the person who's aware than it does the one who is, who is not. It's like, oh, you pick off low-hanging fruit because they're ignorant or they're stupid to you? You're stupid. You're stupid to argue with them. You're stupid because you're attacking a person who has exactly the same problem you do, but they just have to be a weaker version of you. Then if you go pick on somebody your own size, you'll find that you get your ass handed to you every single time, especially if you try to do it outside in real life. But I'm making that as a point for any, any of those who may fight i mean because i'm just saying this because i've dealt with all of this crap in my own head i had to straighten myself out and i didn't realize what i was doing and how unconscious my behavior was such to the point that i've probably almost lost my life three or four times in my adulthood and not because of drug overdoses or anything else just by being like ignorant like like dumb almost like oh yeah you got involved with this person and they did all these things and they went to jail but you know they've changed you know that kind of stuff like those kind of lowering your guard and not seeing the bigger picture and how because that's how empty i was i was trying to find my identity in other people and and by by them being quote my friend and liking me i felt okay so I really didn't have to deal with myself. And so if they, if they did anything I didn't like, then I could not like them and then I'd be the good person. We tell, I mean, there's different ways you could do this. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm being honest about my own shortcomings in life throughout all of my, my young adult years, which left me in a hole at 30, 38 to dig out. So I'm trying to help people to avoid these traps in their minds which they set for themselves, unaware that the in, unintended consequences of that, if you knew where you were going, you would stop immediately and course correct. Because let me just give you an example. My father went to Notre Dame. He was a star athlete, not at Notre Dame, but in uh, college, um, grade school and high school. Went to Notre Dame, graduated, was a successful businessman. He drank himself for 65 years, smoked about as long, destroyed his children, destroyed his family. His company, when he died, was worth $22 million a year, and he died penniless. I don't think my father, in his wildest dreams, when he was going through all of that, imagined that that's how it would end. And that only half of his family was there when he died because he was such a bastard to them. And he also was a nice guy too. That's how abuse works because it's complicated. It's not one dimensional. It's not simplistic. It has many, many layers, many, many illusions, many, many of our beliefs as children imprinted into those myths or those illusions 
And so it's our job in this time to reflect back upon all that we have been through in our own unique individual lives and collectively and come to a head and say, this division, if you want it, you can have it. I and my family and my friends and the people I love are going to come together, not to oppose this whole thing, but to create the world that we want to live in. And as we grow with that, we're going to give it and share it everywhere we go, what we've learned. We're going to teach people how to live through the way that we learned not living to living, because that is your greatest teacher right there. And that gives you the most authority and the accountability and the authenticity to reach people because you can speak from the heart, you can speak from your core being, all that you have been through and all that you know is true. And the knowing for yourself, you may start with beliefs, but beliefs are limiting. The knowing for yourself gives you the greatest advantage of knowing what is true and what is false. Beliefs can deceive you. You being intelligent is not enough. You being clever and smart is not enough. What it really means to be a full human being is one that is in the present. And even if you're not in a state of unconditional love, you have the acknowledgement of what you are in and can see through that illusion that most people don't. By doing this work, by doing this trauma healing, by going deeper into yourself. And it's not about problems. This is all about solutions. So there is a way out. And you have to know this. If you were traumatized as a child, you lived through the most vulnerable and defenseless of all of your times where it really could have ended or it could have really turned horrifically, worse than it probably did and played out. But you are alive. You are alive right now. And that means that no matter what happened to you, you can't be crushed, you can't be destroyed because you're alive right now. And you can do something with that awareness and that knowledge. And you can turn that into meaning and you can begin to help people who need it, who do not have access to the utility that you do. And then you can heal them too. You can change this world. And see, here's the thing. By those acts alone, you will create a world that is healthy for children to live in because all who are healed, they will create children that will be less damaged. They will have in them the ability to make creative, rational decisions that are not based on emotions of the past traumas for which they're responding and reacting to the stimuli of, but they'll be able to be creative in their solutions because they will see that, yeah, I used to do that too. And I used to think that way until I considered this. What do you think about that? And you start asking questions of people rather than telling them what they should be doing or what they should be thinking. You go, what do you think about that? How could that go wrong? You praise people and give them honest encouragement, enthusiasm. Do not go around discouraging people. Because one of the things I learned from somebody who dealt with victims of trauma, this was just yesterday, actually, and it made total sense. He said, I dealt with a girl who was raped. And she was, she said, John, she was starting to cut her wrist to kill herself. This is a successful soccer player who was raped on a campus a couple years ago. And what he told me was, he said, when we were trained to deal with people who had been through this level of trauma, we said every choice that she makes or the, vic the victim, the survivor makes needs to be supported every step of the way. Even if you see the flaws in it, even if you see the um, knowing that it may not end the way they want or the way they expect but it was to be with them because this is how they were feeling and they had to work through it on their own because it represented their survival, everything, their core being. 
They had to put themselves on the line to work through it, whether it be we want to go this direction with court or we don't. If we don't want to press charges, she needs to be supported regardless of what you think. This is not about your needs. It's about being in service to someone else who's going through a very difficult time. So having that experience yourself, you can give that experience to somebody else. The help and the healing that you do yourself, you can give to other people. This is why I go back to the Bible and I tell people, Jesus said, you will do my acts and greater. And there have been many interpretations of that, but I'm just telling you this. I'm not saying you're you're the son of man, okay? I'm saying that we must begin to realize that we are the true sons and daughters of this earth. We take back our authority and our birthright by given to us by our creator. If we do not do this, I'm just telling people very clearly, the trauma will manifest into the transhumanist agenda. It will go right into the mind control program it will be, it will, it is, let me just say this. These people plan this shit out in advance for years before they do anything. In fact, most people believe it's 50 to 100 years that they have planned out. Whether or not that goes to plan is up to you and I. It really is. There is nobody coming in off that bench to save you. And let me just tell you this, and this is not against anybody who holds out hope for other things. Anybody that this system brings you or offers you is to keep that illusion going. I'm sorry, and it sucks, but it's true. And I and I and I'm I'm, I'm this is where I get with Trump people. I, I voted for Trump in 2020 because I was against tyranny, and it's not because I hated the man or you know like it wasn't like oh I voted him for him, but no, I'll own it. I'll own it every which way. But what I'm saying to people is at the end of the day, he pushed those vaccines. And we can't really talk about that because I don't want you to get struck yeah. off of YouTube. But uh, he pushed them and he didn't have to. And when I look at that, I, I listen to a couple of my other friends and I understand what is going on. But it remains to be seen. Again, if you allow these people to live rent free in your head, their world will exist in you and you will be a co-creator because you will absorb all of the information and the emotion and the programming and you will begin to co-create it with them again. So my thing is this is like you don't have to do not hate the world, love and embrace the world. But the only way that you're going to get there is through your own heart. Nobody else can do it for you. And um Somebody, I, I know we got to wrap it up here, but somebody asked me earlier, I think it was Renee Cruz, and if you're still listening, I appreciate you, uh, asked me what my next movie is. If you're, um, let me just tell you, I, I've made six independent films, all of them micro budget, um, without Hollywood's money. I have had investors, I've taken profits from my other films, although after investors are paid, if the film is profitable, um, most of them have broken even barely, but there's other ones that have done three times, like Child's Voice has done three times what it was made for. Um, uh, but here's the thing. I put my blood, sweat, and tears into all my work. I put my own money into it. I put my own time, you know, time, talent, and treasure. And we're doing, uh, our next movie is called Game Day. And it is a departure from the previous subject matters that we've dealt with, but all of the talents that we have Game day is on GoFundMe. The reason why I'm telling people this is, look, I'm trying to raise $5,000 in three weeks. I've already raised $2,500 in, in two. And the thing I'm, I'm wanting to tell you is, look, we're making movies that Hollywood will not make. They will not make these movies. They may have made them in the past, but they won't make them again. Um, they have an agenda that they're going to follow, and they're going to follow it, and they're going to follow it and follow it till the end. And all I'm saying is this, if you believe in what I'm telling you tonight, if you wanna support my work, if you wanna give something to help make a movie, go to Game Day on Game Day Movie through GoFundMe. If you put in um, 20 bucks, whatever, we're gonna give you a live stream, we're gonna give you downloads, we're gonna give you, but, but it's not just the perks. It's like, we're making a movie that is dealing with today's time and family. 
And so uh, this, this issue is, it's, it's a raw, humorous and inspirational story about an Italian American family from Philadelphia that gather together on their annual rivalry game against the Dallas Cowboys, their most hated rival, Philadelphia Eagles versus the Dallas Cowboys. And over four quarters, with food, fights, and bitter realizations that begin to rise in the family, everything begins to become a rivalry in the house. And this 50-year-old father and husband, who is really in the midst of a coming-of-age story for him and everybody else, is watching his family and his, um, he's basically watching his family come undone. And um, I uh, just want to tell you, like, look, I'm, I'm going up there to Philadelphia in three weeks. We're going to make a hell of a movie with an all-star cast of actors. Some of them you may know or have seen, but it's really about the core essence of this movie, which is to thy own self be true. That once you hear the truth, you will be set free. And you'll be set free to live the way that you want to live, not the way that you think you have to live or the way that other people tell you you should live, but start to feel and think and act in the direction that you want to go in your life. That's what our movie is about. And it's done with humor in the same spirit of Little Miss Sunshine with all the great drama. And so if you want to support us, go to Game Day, uh, Game Day the Movie or Game Day Movie on GoFundMe, or you can look up my name, John Paul Rice, on there. And uh, Is that you, one word, Game Day Movie? Sorry, uh, let me double check. No, no, it's okay. ticker down here. Yep. Game Day me, Movie? Let me double check that. Uh, if you go to Go, like, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> uh, let me get it up here. I just want to double check, because I one time I gave it out the wrong way, and everybody's like, where is it? It's, is it at Game Day Movie? No, no, it's GoFundMe.com forward slash game day movie and then it'll pull up the page there and um or you can look me up search by my name john paul rice on gofundme and i think it comes up as well but um uh that's our next film that's the one we're doing that's the one we'll release uh at the towards the end of this year but um we've we've just we've put together you know this is our seventh film in 11 years and we've perfected the art. Um, what I want to do long term is create a studio where I get young people who are coming out of film school with enormous amount of talent, uh, but don't have that opportunity after doing a couple of shorts or maybe a feature. They want to do their next feature. I want to put together a scalable business model with self-distribution that enables the recoupment on investment but more so such to the point that it doesn't put the filmmaker or the investor in bankruptcy or law with a heavy amount of loss we want to be able to make a scalable business model where independent filmmakers that we see have talent and a voice we want to we want to work with them on story script we want to work with them on production we want to help them create their full vision and give them the tools that they need so Eventually, what I'd like to step aside and do is be a mentor to a lot of young filmmakers to help them feel and understand the richness of and value of what they're trying to communicate through their art, which is all about feelings. At the end of the day, it is not about, you know, you, don't, you remember lines in a movie, but you remember movies because of how they made you feel. Those memories, the memories of watching them, the memories of when you walked out of that theater, it stirred something in you. It shook something up. So what you have as an artist is you have this responsibility in film, especially, where I get to capture two, an hour and a half to two hours of your time out of your life in the dark on a group of people. It could be hundreds, it could be thousands, it could be millions. This is stronger and more powerful than any president. And you have a responsibility to show me something that can change my life, that can show me something I haven't seen before. Or you can show me a, a same, the same story, but in a new way. You show it to me like Star Wars did. It's a Greek mythology story in a, in a, in a science fiction movie. You know, this is, this is the thing. And it ta art is the honest, unconscious expression that you follow a belief on 
about something that grabs you emotionally and you want to go in and discover that and and see in the process of that creation it what did it change in you what did it and you put that into the work of the script and the talent that you assemble not because it's some business model but because organically this cohesive structure that you're building in this story you're going to take me on a journey and you're going to show me things that i haven't seen before but i know are there that are true see film what film does what art does to us is a mirror into our hearts and our soul but we're projecting ourselves into these fictionalized characters which we identify with psychologically according to what's in us and the story and, and it's a complex dance but it's really fascinating because we pick and choose our characters according to the way we feel about them. Some people like villains, some people like this character in a movie. Some people didn't like her. I didn't like the way, you know, but I liked him. And you're like, how do you like him? What? So this is what is amazing at play. So when you create something that's so authentic, it's filled with emotions, you get reactions. You get people thinking and talking and learning and evolving and emotions begin to move things inside of them that they don't necessarily know how to articulate but you did you did through your art your pursuit of your belief and your discovery of that journey for which it taught you and changed you you in, you integrated all of that into the film and it's felt it's not spoken so much as it's felt best movies don't preach to you the best movies let you discover what it is that is really going on inside of you rather than to lead you down to believe this or think that or feel that in the final analysis there is manipulation involved but it's not on a level of i need you to have this desired outcome i'm just going well this is how i see it folks you know anyway um we've been on quite a while <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's three uh, hours here. Well, we're rounding You're it just... out. I, I don't think I've been past three, except on Young Pharaoh and maybe David oh, wow. Whitehead. But both of those episodes were super popular. So I'm hoping the same for you. <laughs> We've got two viewers on the live stream right now. Oh, no, not two. It's 34. <laughs> okay. No, I love but, it. Uh, and yeah, I'll, you, I'll be happy usually I come on at 7 p.m. So I guess a lot of people didn't get that memo but i'm sure it'll have oh, okay. a lot by tomorrow morning yeah so um but it's anyway been great to have you on here i mean everything you're saying it, it's so great to um have someone that's also from the entertainment industry on my show because i don't do that very often and um i don't know if you know this about me but i've been in quite a few movies and tv shows mm -hmm. myself and um so it's definitely been interesting with the entertainment industry the past couple of years i kind of myself have gotten to a point where i'm like oh, i don't know if i want to be a part of it in the way i've been a part of it i feel like there needs to be a reworking here so everything you've been saying here is really incredible and i definitely want to encourage everyone to go check out his uh gofundme for game day movie and um yeah so you know i think i'm gonna wrap this up here because we've been <laughs> on for quite a while but it's really great to have you on Thank you for uh, for allowing me to come on and and sharing um, you know with your audience. I, I just I really appreciate everything that's going on today, and the fact that we have this space to to share with others and hope it leads to other good things for people as as they move through their life and their journey through it. Definitely, and you know I, I'm so glad there's people like you in the entertainment industry that are trying to come out and you know make their own films that aren't a part of you know everything that's going on with the the a-listers right now but kind of as you were saying kind of encouraging filmmakers to start going on their own direction mm -hmm. so i think that's really incredible so it, it was great to have you on here john and uh, i just want to let everyone know again to uh make sure you check out my shaman spears at shamanspears.com there's four left and uh, I will be in the new studio next week. So I'm really excited for that. It's going to be very interesting. Uh, so make sure you all tune in. I should be Tuesday and Thursdays from now on in the new studio. So I'll let you all know once I got the next interview set up. But uh, any final words, John? No, I just... You um, have a lot of final words already. No, 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 no. <laughs> it was like five-minute monologue. No, no. Um, 
just um, what I tell people at the end of some of my emails when I write to them, and I feel like this is appropriate, is just keep walking, keep walking forward in faith with love in your heart for the child that you were born to be. And the world will begin to change because everybody wants to be back in that time where there were no troubles and life was about play and fun. And when you bring that into the world, you are summoning some of the most powerful energy in all of the world that can overcome any kind of darkness that you can imagine in out all of the history in the light that is within that love. So keep, keep moving one step in front of each other. That's all you can do. And you keep moving forward and things will begin to change for sure. Thank you, John. It was so great having you on here. All right, until next time, everyone. Uh, see you again next time on Apollo's Odyssey, over and out.